Good evening and welcome to the Spokane City Council meeting of November 29th. Good evening and welcome to the Spokane City Council meeting for November 29th. We'll start with a roll call. Council President Beggs. Present. Council Member Burke. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Mum. Here. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right, and we are going to have a proclamation for World AIDS Day in a moment, and then we're going to follow that with uh, two administrative reports from one from the Human Rights Commission uh, and one from Community Minded Enterprises. So we'll start out with the proclamation. Council Member Betsy Wilkerson is going to read it, and we are joined by Grant Ogren, who will speak once the proclamation has been read. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, Council President. Whereas this year marks 40 years since the first five cases of what later became known as AIDS were officially reported, and we honor more than 36 million people globally who have died from AIDS-related illnesses since the start of the epidemic. And whereas we recognize that a strong commitment to ending HIV epidemic globally means addressing health inequities and ensuring the voices of people with HIV are central in all of our work. And we likewise recognize that despite the many hard won gains over the last 40 years, HIV remains a threat domestically and globally. And whereas, informed by voices from the most impacted communities, we remain deeply committed to ensuring equity in programs, research, and policies, and serving those most in need of support. And we hereby renew our commitment to do our part to end the HIV epidemic in Spokane and around the world. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim December 1st, 2021, as World AIDS Day in Spokane and ask citizens in our community to join me in pledging to help end this epidemic in our lifetime. Grant, I'll turn it over to you. And I don't see it. He was on. Okay. Grant, welcome back to City Council. Um, if you want to say a Thank few words. Like we use WebEx for our platforms and for some reason, nothing's working for me today. <laughs> um, thank you so much for reading the proclamation and for everything that the city council does. Um, I'm the executive director of Spokane AIDS Network. Um, I was previously the president of Spokane AIDS Network for about seven years, and I've been in the ED position now for two years. Um, we are always concentrating on um, making life better for our community. That is what we're all about. Um, World AIDS Day, this year's theme is ending the HIV epidemic, equitable access, everyone's voice. That last part to me is very important. We're in talks right now with the Department of Health on looking at the way the wording is done for a few of the laws that are out there around HIV. And we have a group of people that are working with us with the Department of Health to make sure that those laws incorporate everybody and don't discriminate. In the past, the wording hasn't been suitable. Um, they were written quite a few years ago. So that is one of our key projects that we're working on right now. Um, Wednesday is World AIDS Day. 
and we will be showcasing two blocks of the AIDS Memorial Quilt between 4 and 8 p.m. at the Washington Cracker Company building, and we'll have some speakers, City Council President included, um, and a few voices of HIV. Um, to me, that is the most important thing is to hear from people that are affected and to show that quilt. Um, the quilt has a very strong meaning for me this year. Um, a couple of the panels were made back in the 90s for a little girl named Kara Claypool. And she went to, I think, Willard Elementary School. So Willard Elementary School put a panel together for her and her family and friends did as well. I didn't know that this panel was available until about four months ago when I started researching. She was my client back in the 90s when she was going through her HIV treatment um, and when we lost her to AIDS. So it has a very different meaning for me this year in bringing these quilts to, to Spokane, and we will actually hopefully have her brother there to speak as well. So I'm working on that. But thank you all for your support. I really appreciate it. I know our community appreciates it as well. Thank you for coming tonight, Grant, and for all the work your organization does as you do, and look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thank um, you. So now we're going to, we periodically get an administrative report from the City of Spokane Human Rights Commission, and we have our commission chair, Lance Kistler, here with some other folks, and I've asked them to spend up to 10 minutes to talk about their work on the Office of Civil Rights proposal that they recently sent us. So, Lance, I, I'll leave it to you to uh, manage the time however you want with your folks. Will do. Thank you, Council President Biggs. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so thank you for having us today. Um, on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, uh, we appreciate Council's support. And just as a, a note to everyone, uh, we do serve as an advisory group to City Council um, with the creation of the position that uh, Darrell Haynes is in. Um, we are really looking forward to uh, further expanding our relationship with um, the City Administration, the Mayor's Office, <clears throat> and of course, um, taking a more proactive role um, with the City when it comes to human rights. Um, part of that is looking at establishing an Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion, and that's why we're here today. So a little bit of um, background and history, uh, and then I will be turning it over to my colleagues who are um, also speaking today, um, various members of work groups, task forces, and others uh, who have come together to make all this work possible, and I'll let each one of them introduce themselves when they speak to their section. So the Office of Civil Rights Task Force was established back in 2019 by the Human Rights Commission um, when the commission saw a very apparent need for uh, an office of such um, to be established at the, at the city. We uh, created this task force to uh, have a representation across our community. Um, it's had anywhere from about uh, 10 members, sometimes a little bit less, um, sometimes a little bit more, all based upon people changing roles and the pandemic. Um, we met a number of times over the past uh, two years, uh, mostly via Zoom. I think we only had one meeting in person before the pandemic hit. Um, but we have representatives from the commission, the Spokane County Human Rights Task Force, Gonzaga, Gonzaga University, specifically their Institute for Hate Studies, yeah. the Spokane NAACP, Tools for Change, Center for Justice, Community Building Foundation, Simba, INBA, various faith groups, and other racial, ethnic, minority, and cultural community groups as well. So a broad spectrum throughout our community here. We collaborated with the Gonzaga Institute for Hate Studies to develop the Glory Benchmark Study during 2020, which was presented to Council back in 2021 when we gave our interim update and shared some core themes that were ascertained from uh, that work. And then the task force collaborated with the Greater Spokane Progress Work Group over this past uh, year or so, and we formally adopted their proposal um, for consideration by the commission, <clears throat> which uh, is greatly based upon uh, a model that was developed at uh, Des Moines, which was part of the research um, that came through with the Glory Benchmark Study. Um, at our last meeting in November, the Human Rights Commission accepted that proposal from the task force and issued our resolution to city leadership 
um, which you all should have received a copy of, as well as a copy of that um, report. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Poyan Lam, who is with Greater Spokane Progress, who will talk a bit about the background and history um, that they have. Poyan? Okay. So um, the coalition of organizations under Greater Spokane Progress has been working on the uh, Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion proposal for a few years now. It started back in 2018 when we were working on the uh, Spokane Progress Plan to identify policy priorities uh, with the coalition of organizations that are part of Greater Spokane Progress. And we quickly realized that for a lot of the issues that we were trying to address, we not only need to have an Office of Civil Rights, but also we need to have an office that is multifaceted and tackles some of the problems at its root causes. And so we realized that this work has to be extended beyond just the writing of the Spokane Progress Plan. And we created a work group specifically to work on the idea and the proposal. And even though the discussion started uh, with concerns from communities of color and also immigrants communities, we realized that uh, the Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion would also, should also serve different marginalized communities. And so we are very intentional in terms of reaching out to a wide spectrum of organizations. As uh, council members have seen in the sign on letters that um, there are 50 plus organizations representing different communities, different marginalized groups. Um, they have, you know, given us feedback. Different groups have given us feedback over time. Um, they have looked at different versions of our proposal, of our models. And um, when we realized that the um, Spoken Human Rights Commission is also working on, um, on the creation of an Office of Civil Rights, we reached out to Lens and um, wanted to see how we can collaborate together because we know that they are also trying to uh, look at different models and reach out to communities uh, to see what would best serve the needs of our specific uh, Spokane communities. And so with conversations with the task force, we have also presented different versions of our models um, and proposal to the Spokane Human Rights Commission and get feedback from them that um, the result of all that work over the years is the proposal the city council members have been shared um, and the framework that we have worked on for years now. Curtis? Um, we're, Lance, we're, could you go to another? We're trying to figure that out. Oh, never mind. Oh, he's there. No, he's there. Okay. Got it. Yeah, they muted me and got my camera off. I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. All right, so, uh, yeah, uh, Curtis Robinson, uh, part of the task force, serves as uh, uh, immediate president, past of the Spokane NAACP uh, branch, um, So, and also is executive director for I Did the Time. So when we were working on this, you know, was, this part is about really demonstrating the need, right? So in 2018, the World Atlas listed uh, Washington as number two in the U.S. with 666 reported hate crime offenses in 2020. Law enforcement agencies also reported a total of 451 hate crimes, 299 which were uh, race and ethnic and ancestry uh, uh, oriented. Uh, and then in 2019, um, well, that was in 2019, and then in, and then we had five, 511 reported hate crimes. So also according to the FBI, uh, the U.S. had the most hate crimes in its, uh, in its history since 2001. Um, reports of hate crimes against uh, API increased 76% over the pandemic. Uh, and Washington State now has a population ranking according to the 2020 census of number 13, yet we were listed as number eight uh, in hate crime groups uh, in 2018. Um, and But we're now listed as number uh, 17 for that for the amount of hate crime groups that we have uh, per capita. Um, the links are in there. Uh, many uh, victims, uh, 
and it's important to understand that many of our victims, and this is where the NAACP comes in this, I'm going to get to that in the next slide, is that many many of our, our victims of these kind of crimes and these kind of offenses, which tie directly into civil rights issues, uh, do not report it. And we do not report it for a reason because, hey, we're not getting, there's there's been no vehicle for that. There hasn't been representation uh, for dealing with that. And we don't get a lot of support from law enforcement agencies as well as the justice system. Next slide, please. So what the NAACP did uh, in, in with this task force is uh, we submitted a report that I had over 130, 31 separate complaints uh, from 2019 through 2020. 87% uh, of them were persons of color, 55% were over 55% were female, over 40% were male, under 5% were LGBTQ+, and that did not include the uh, ranging of the 60 plus letters that we had in that same time window from, uh, from our uh, incarcerable institutions here locally. And the important thing about this and this demonstrates to me is because the NAACP is not a legal organization. It is an advocacy organization. Yet we have been the ones fielding and organizations like us have been fielding the weight of these kinds of issues manifesting in our communities of color. And an important thing to also really kind of understand here is that right now, and you can see the link in the, in the bottom uh, 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 section of this slide, is that when you try to look up uh, civil rights issues and complaints and history and data, there really isn't any, at least not that's very easy or even semi-easily to find. And I'm pretty computer savvy. So it's important to note that the whole this whole thing has been happening here for a while. And one of the reasons that this office, uh, exploratory office came into being were because of the history of racial issues such as the slurs at uh, MLK Center, um, the postings at Morningstar, uh, the damage at the uh, Diwali Asian uh, Bistro, the funding of the uh, downtown Black Lives Matter mural, and last year, uh, the defacing of Beth Shalom, as well as so many others, because any real history can see that this has been going on over here for a long time with zero accountability. And I pass. Well, Jan, do you want to um, talk a little about the research from GSP? Uh, you're muted, Poyan. So the research that has been done by GSP started again uh, from the very early on with the discussion on the Spokane Progress Plan. And at that time, um, Cam Zuisor, um, an attorney from Center for Justice, was doing research on hate incidents and, and crimes in the Spokane area and trying to look at how those incidents are reported. And through that research, she also has looked at uh, different cities in terms of what their um, Office of Civil Rights are doing in these regards and how they're handling these um, cases, collecting statistics. And so from there, we looked at, you know, for example, um, Eugene as a model. Uh, we also, through the connections that GFP has with the um, Government Alliance on Race and Equity to look at uh, different cities, for example, uh, with uh, Austin, Texas. And so, uh, and also with um, input from different organizations that have been part of the work groups and others. Uh, in conversations um, about what their communities would need and how to get their members of the communities to be more engaged, that they would build more trust with a city. So if issues come up, they're more likely to report it or to work with the city to tackle it. And so with all this research, this is how we come up with the multifaceted model that we're forming areas of work that the Office of Civil Rights, Equity and Inclusion should tackle. And also, um, under uh, the Spokane Human Rights Commission Office of Civil Rights and Task Force, um, that they have also looked at the data that Curtis mentioned from the NWACP Spokane uh, complaints, and also um, that members of the task force have looked into the history of Office of Civil Rights in Spokane, which one ex once existed, and also the very helpful um, Glory Benchmark report done by Dr. Christine Hoover 
from Gonzaga University. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, in Dr. Christine Hoover's reports, what she looked at is um, a few cities that are of similar size as Spokane. And so she looked at Boise, Idaho, Des Moines, Iowa, Madison, Wisconsin, and also looked at uh, different cities in the Pacific Northwest area, including Portland, Seattle, um, and Tacoma. Next slide, please. And one of the things that really, you know, helped me think of the task of creating um, an Office of Civil Rights Equity Inclusion in Spokane differently is the um, numbers that she presented in this table. I think, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, what we think this is, this is a huge ask, this is a monumental task in terms of investment, but when she broke down the numbers, in terms of per capita investment into a city's population, it makes me realize that we're not talking about a huge investment uh, with something so important with an office that can make such a difference. It's really, you know, if we look at what Des Moines, Iowa has invested, we are talking about, you know, under $4 per person in the city. And so I think this make us, you know, realize that, you know, this is something doable. We are not com comparing large cities that have invested a lot of money because their population warrants it, but we are looking at the Moines, Iowa that has a similar population and is similar in Spokane in other ways, and it is really something that is achievable, but at the same time would have a tremendous return of investment to the few dollars per capita that we will be investing in. Um, next slide, please. And so um, this is the framework that is a proposed model that uh, the GSP work group come up with, but also have been getting, getting feedback from different groups, including the, um, the Spokane Human Rights Commission's um, OCL Task Force. And so we realized the urgency of, of having the staff to take complaints and to investigate uh, the cases that have been brought forward, as Curtis mentioned. So this is a huge amount of work, and that needs to be done immediately. But when a complaint is being brought forward, it means that someone is already hurt. A community is already hurt. And also people's livelihood, if we were talking about employment, or people's well-being in terms of housing, is already has already been negatively affected. And that's why we think it is very important to have an Office of Civil Rights Equity and Inclusion that also takes a proactive approach in terms of educating our community, uh, educating businesses, educating agencies, um, so that we will do things right in the first place to minimize the complaints that are needed to be brought forward. And also, um, a lot of times, people like Curtis mentioned, they might not even bring complaints forward. For example, with immigrant communities, they might not know, they might not understand how things work. They don't know whom to contact, um, whom to reach out to, and also with language barriers. And so I think for a city, we really also need to be very proactive in educating different communities with resources in different languages so that people understand that the city will support them uh, when they experience discrimination, when hate crimes happen, um, and they know that's what their rights are here, um, protected by the city of Spokane. Next slide, please. And so um, we look at the GLOWY benchmark report because Dr. Kristen Hoover has done such um, an amazing job, and also some of the things that she finds uh, really correspond with what we are saying, pretty much we need an office that have to have multiple staff and also would have to cover, you know, these kind of main areas of work. Um, like I talked about, you know, with not just taking complaints, but also doing investigation, but also doing education, uh, doing community outreach, and also routinely to look at our city, our 
our different agencies to look at where they are in terms of equity and inclusion. And so we are just trying to come up with a realistic budget of what it would be like for Spokane and the scale of the office for Spokane. And so we use Des Moines, Iowa as a model and we use the $3.30 for cent uh, per capita funding level and extrapolate um, into the budget that we put into our proposal with six full-time uh, positions. And so even if we adjust you know, for the larger, slightly larger population in Spokane and the higher cost of living um, in Spokane, it really is only about 0.1% of the city budget that we are asking for with the vision that the community have, have put forward. And so I think, again, you know, I, 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 my mind was changed when I look at the glory reports. Um, and so, um, and to really, you know, like make us think that we are making a very modest, a very humble request, uh, here and and that is going to be our a tremendous first step for Spokane uh, to move forward to be a city that will be known for its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, Nick, Dr. Like, Lam, I'd like to just add in there that also justice, because that's what our people are looking for. You know, that's what we need is we need racial and economic justice. Thank you for adding that. Curtis. Thank you, Poyani Curtis. Um, next, Jarrell is going to, Jarrell Haynes is going to speak to um, how this can be operationalized and the work that he's doing in his role. Jarrell? Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, City Council President and City Council members for uh, allowing us to come and speak before you this evening. Um, my name is Jarrell Haynes, and this is the first time I actually get to be in front of you all in my new role as the Civil Rights Coordinator here for the City of Spokane. Um, it's been absolutely an absolute honor to work with alongside Lance and Puyan and Curtis and Greater Spokane Progress, the Human Rights Commission, and uh, the OCR Task Force over the last few months. Um, you know, my job is is to develop it and operationalize exactly what this could look like to take the resources that City Council and in partnership with the administration provide us, so that we can imagine exactly what an Office of Civil Rights and a position like mine can look like here in the city of Spokane to not only best support our community members and our community organizations, but also uh, best, you know, support our, our city government and, and help protect us and, and prevent, you know, uh, civil rights violations from ever occurring in the first place. So, uh, like I mentioned, part of my role is, is to also educate staff members and community members around what their civil rights are around Title 18 and now newly Title 6 and 9 um, as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just really excited to, to be having these conversations and I look forward to, to all of us being able to sit down together and, and be able to dream a model that's ideal for the city of Spokane. Thank you, Jerome. So uh, to wrap it up, uh, next steps that we see is to uh, allocate funding for the fiscal year 22 to begin the process of creating an Office of Civil Rights Equity and Inclusion. Um, we have proposed the 0.1% uh, and there's the specific dollar amount in the um, proposal that went forward to City Council uh, as a starting point. Um, ensuring that uh, Mr. Jarrell Haynes, our Civil Rights Officer and Coordinator, is provided with the resources and support needed to develop that office. Um, utilize the GFP model, so the Des Moines um, model, as a blueprint. So the important um, word there is blueprint for operationalizing um, an office here in Spokane, including its role, its responsibility, the funding, resources, and so on, aiming for that 0.1% of our total budget. We believe that the um, office that serves the city and eventually, hopefully, the county and our region um, has appropriate oversight. It has the ability to enact change and operate in a nonpartisan manner very effectively and has a seat at the decision-making table. At this time, we stand um, ready for any questions that council members may have. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lance and company. Um, any council members have questions? Council member Mum. Just real briefly, some of that data that I had was very interesting and thank you so much for presenting it. Uh, it's really important that we understand what's happening in our community. 
And when you see the data, it's pretty shocking. Is that just for the municipality of Spokane or is that all inclusive of Spokane County? Does anyone know? I, I would say that so the complaints that the NAACP receives is probably um, Spokane County and perhaps beyond. Uh, Curtis, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you, Councilman, uh, and thank you, Lance. Yeah, so they are, they are, they are Spokane wide. Right, so Spokane County wide, um, and again, that was just the, that was just a slice. That was just a slice period from beginning of 2019 to uh, January 2019 to July of uh, 2020, um, and so that that was just a picture of the stuff that we're dealing with. But I also want to add that other context too is that that report is just. You know, uh, things that came in by email, phone calls, and what the not, but that also did not include the stuff that we've gotten from the prison systems here locally as well. Yeah. And so that is still rolling through today. It's been rolling through the entire time, and it's been on the shoulders of volunteers uh, to deal with systemic issues. So I hope you take this message to um, our friends in Spokane Valley, and I hope you take it to our county commissioners as well. I think this full report should be done at their legislative sessions as well. It's that important. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Councilmember Stratton. I just wanted to add a thought or two. When I started at the city in 2005, we did have an office of human rights and one of the big problems was while we had it we had one person and that person was constantly running around trying to get assistance from other organizations including the washington state human rights commission so as we go through this process which i'm completely supportive of we really need to hold tight to the idea that there needs to be staffing. We need to have people um, that can hit the ground, that can take those complaints. We need to have some um, enforcement is a big deal and how do you how do you process complaints and then follow it up with enforcement. Um, this is I appreciate your efforts so much because I can remember I'm going back to the frustrations in the early 2000s that you would see things and people would talk to you and you had absolutely really yourself that that one staff person that could um, try and help. But I, I think we really need to, if we're going to do this, we do it right and we um, we push for those positions because you can really make a difference when you have people paying attention to those, um, um, some of the nuances and some of the particulars of that. So. I appreciate this work very, very much. And if there's anything I can do to help, I'm sure we're all available to help. Thanks. All right. Well, again, thank you all for all your work and for to all the other people who contributed to it. Um, let's now go to our other administrative report. And <clears throat> we have Lee Williams from Community Minded Enterprises giving us a report. And Lee, welcome. I saw some news that you're retiring after many great years of service. I am. We, we thank you for all that service and congratulate you, uh, you. on this milestone. Um, but what do you have for us tonight? Well, um, thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank, uh, thank you, uh, Council President Beggs and the City Council for inviting us here this evening to give a presentation. Um, it's my pleasure to lead the presentation and I have some colleagues with me, um, Deshaun Bedford and Michael Bethley, who are the staff members for the CMTV programming and uh, our administrative staff, Nancy Rust is our CFO and Sarah Desital is our philanthropy officer and we work as a team to support the station and help it to move forward. Our mission for Community Minded is to advance the quality of life for all the people in Spokane and across the state of Washington, especially for those who may lack the resources and are historically marginalized. So I really appreciated listening to the previous presentation. I think it really tells us a lot about where our community is as far as <clears throat> 
um, advancing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and the road that we have to travel. Um, hopefully, um, equipment and vision of CMTV can help move some of that along as well. Uh, we look forward to that. Um, I did uh, give a PowerPoint presentation to kind of help guide our presentation to Hannah Lee to put up for us. <clears throat> Excuse me, all of a sudden I have this frog and it's really inconvenient. Um, she's hoping, Hannah Lee's hoping you will share it. Oh, that I will share it. Oh my goodness. I, <laughs> okay. If you all will hang on a minute, I will pull it up. I wasn't counting on that, so it's going to take me a second. Hold up, I can share for you. Oh, can you? Um, as long as I have, can I have permission to share? Can Char Lady Men have permission to share? Um, working on it. Okay. get that, Annalie. Okay. Char should have it now. There she goes. Okay, we'll start out with the video and then we'll get into our, our uh, presentation. Oh, can't hear it, Char. Yeah, we're not hearing the sound, Char, but there might not be anything you can do about that. So. It's just music, so you're only missing the musical okay. accompaniment. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Oh, Char, the, oh, there we go. So really the, the mission of Community Minded TV is making digital media and video production accessible. Um, I think... Uh, it started back in 2007 with a vision from Community Minded that where it's dedicated to providing community programming and making digital media available for everybody. Um, here's some of the ways that we've been dedicated to serving, giving voice to the voiceless and serving the underserved are really two of our top reasons for providing the service, making digital media accessible to the public and bridging the, the, the digital divide. <clears throat> and most especially, especially during the, not the uh, pandemic, supporting area nonprofits in their missions that they have in serving the community. So Deshaun and Michael speak just a little bit to some of the programming on the station that's local and national. You can yes. stop it there, Char. Uh, so one of our biggest missions for our public access television is to try to have the majority of it be local programming and stuff. So a lot of like music videos, um, art shows, whatever type of uh, uh, events that are happening here in town, we definitely try to figure out a way to be a part of them or Get, loan out cameras for people to go film those so they can bring them back to community minded television and so much for like Catholic mass and the Valley council and stuff. And so, um, we just try our best to, to really try to stay local. I think right now we're probably about between 50 and 60% local programming. Um, we do have some national shows that we do air. Um, the people in community really do like those shows and we know this because if we don't play them, we definitely get some phone calls. Uh, we don't play Catholic Mass. We get some phone calls. So it's just nice to know that people are watching Channel 14, even though some people may not think people are watching, but we definitely get phone calls. And we'll even have people show up to the station if something's not going right. So 
but yeah, so just to have the opportunity to play local programming is very big for, for our station. So. Thanks, Deshaun. You know, one of the ways that we have expanded what we've done over the last couple of years is by hiring two additional staff members. That's allowed us to do increased education and technical assistance, having someone be there so that when producers, local producers come in that want to use our equipment, they have somebody that can help them out and help guide them to do that. Apologize for the, the uh, PowerPoint being a little jumpy, but uh, we'll, we'll just make the best of it and move on to the next slide, Char. We really wouldn't be doing justice if we didn't talk about the pandemic. The studio was closed to the public from March through November of 2020. During this time, they were able to shift focus to assist local organizations that were hosting virtual fundraising events. As you can imagine, when um, all of a sudden, nonprofits couldn't have fundraisers, there was a bit of a panic and looking to video and to studios to help do that. And we had some very successful ones. Um, Deshaun, what, what were a couple of uh, examples of those that you were thinking were worth mentioning? Uh, I think all the ones that are on the screen are definitely worth mentioning. Okay. Um, just because they all do bring something positive to the community, especially like Project Beauty Share with the hygiene and giving women and people who may not have the best of stuff, the opportunity to still come down and, and take care of their hygiene and everything else. Um, even so much for uh, Volunteers of America, uh, mm -hmm. Hope and Hope. I mean, all of them definitely bring something. Um, it was great that we were able to help them raise the money that they were looking for to help keep their operations going and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I was just lucky enough that we had the equipment and the know-how and the talented people from all of us that were involved to sit there and be able to help the community out like that, especially Spokane Hope. They called us and they were kind of, didn't know what to do. They were kind of nervous and scared, which I think we all were because it was all kind of new to us. But it was just great just to work with some of these nonprofits that I know they mm -hmm. really um, rely on fundraising. And so for community-minded television to work with other, other nonprofits, it definitely helped everybody out, it helped us out, it helped the community out, and it definitely helped it help the people who really need those services. Thank you, Deshaun. I know it was a it was a big relief to two organizations to be able to provide their fundraisers, and that was something that um, we're really proud to be able to help with. Okay, Shar, you can move it ahead. Okay. Um, another really, I think, important thing that, that we did during this time was to develop some academies. Deshaun, you want to talk a little bit about how the partnership with Spokane Public Schools came about? Yeah, and I'll definitely have uh, Michael Bessley jump in on this, too, because okay, great. Was, once again, it's, it's always a team effort and stuff, and I think just because of some of the people we know in the community, and Sarah as well, to jump in this, too, but we definitely wanted to try to do more stuff for the community when it came to the youth to maybe try to educate them more on production and stuff. So I'll kind of let Mike explain a little more on this stuff. So. Okay, great. Um, hello. Uh, so yes, we, we were able to just um, create a, uh, an academy that, that really focused uh, on building the education and understanding uh, and giving access to the youth for, the, for video production. And one thing, about the academy that we were able to accomplish was getting them a wide array of students in um, from from um, different parts of the community, but uh, being able to focus on the Northeast community and um, a couple of, of uh, other schools in Rogers, I believe Rogers, Shaw, and um, Gary, if, I, if I'm correct, but being able to focus on those communities and bring them the opportunity to to uh, experience that hands-on touch with that production was mm -hmm. something that we were striving to do, and we were able to do it. Um, the the partnership that 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 came through was from um, Oscar Harris and the Office of Community Engagement at the Spokane Public Schools, and then alongside, I believe it was Innovia, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but uh, that that also opened up those opportunities for that partnership. 
Yes, that is correct. We were able to offer all of those students that participated in that particular program um, a totally no cost programming. So they were able to participate um, with their scholarships paid for. And we also just tried to offer that to anybody who, who was interested in um, participating in any of our trainings. We also partnered with Parks and Rec. Um, as you know, they have a fantastic activities guide and a great uh, social and online network. Um, so we were really able to uh, reach additional audiences through um, that new partnership with them. And um, like I said, if people were interested and they felt that cost was a barrier, we really worked with them to try to find a partner in the community that would help them participate at no cost. And this is a very hands-on um, project that they all did. I know in the in terms of the the Northeast group that came in, they actually uh, brainstormed the commercial, um, planned every part of the commercial, the actors who ran the cameras, who were the audio people, they wrote the script, they had a director. I mean, they had a real experience with uh, with media by the time they were done with their with their experience. So it was really very special. Um, very special for the kids, all of them. Okay, well, we'll move on to talk about the financial overview, and I will call on our CFO, Nancy Rust, to talk us through that. Nancy? Sure. Um, I know Char is having difficulty uh, managing the PowerPoint off of her device, so if this bounces around a little bit, uh, we'll do the best we can to get through this. Um, so as you see, we had the... Uh, uh, the financial success in 2020 during the pandemic that was unprecedented as far as other uh, organizations uh, were facing themselves. And we did receive a $160,000 grant from the city of Spokane that basically financed our ability to do the great work that we were able to do during the pandemic for the community and, and just to keep the station open in general. Uh, we also received $80,000 for uh, via the PPP funds in support of salaries and rental expenses in 2020. Uh, in 2021, of course, we don't have uh, the city grant nor the PPP funds, so the uh, shortfall you see there is a direct correlation between those two funding avenues not carrying over into 2021. Historically, CME has financed uh, subsidized CMTV roughly about $50,000 a year, and um, that is not reflected in this 2021 revenue um, picture as well. So the net income of 127000 is a little bit de deceiving because it does not in, uh, take into account our in-kind contributions from the current organization, that being CME, nor you know, the carryover of the 79308 offsets that um, shortfall in 2021 as well. So if you, if we had the 2019 numbers to compare, we actually were able to increase our contractual revenues in support of the, the uh, services we offer to the community by about 20%, which is substantial. That's the biggest uh, financial uh, increase we've had in several years, as well as the classes, as you see here in 2020, of course, the, uh, the studio was closed, but we received $75 in classes in 2020, and we're, uh, 2021, we were able to secure 28,564, which is almost a 100% increase from 2019. In 2019, we only were able to secure $300 in classes. So our classes to the community have, uh, you know, just gone off the charts, which is really great to see. So overall, financially, um, we are really positioned well, considering we are just coming out of a pandemic and the work that they've been able to do in 2020 and carry on into 2022 is really astronomical and they should be very proud of themselves. Um, and we thank the city very much for your your financial support. Um, it has been, it's been able, it's keeping the door open. So thank you for that support for sure. Yes. We, we can't state that enough, um, how much that was appreciated and um, what it lent to having us really um, look at how we could throw all of our support into areas that we really felt that the community needed 
which were the supports for nonprofits and also the workshops. Um, really critical as you know, it's sometimes hard to remember, but a year ago, things were pretty slow and, and really shut down. And um, the, the fact that this program was able to thrive some during that time is, is a testament to the people who were operating the program. And there's our CMTV van. Um, Deshaun or Mike, you want to talk about how the van is used in, in the services for CMTV? Yeah, I think um, the van definitely has given us the opportunity to be mobile, go to places that we didn't think we were able to go. Um, we have something we call it's called a TriCaster, but we like to call it a production in a, in a box. So um, we get to do our live switching and PTZ cameras and pretty much put it in the back of the van and go to places and really just meet the, the community that have needs that may not be able to come to our location or they may want to use their facility. But having the van definitely gave us the, an opportunity to just to be mobile and, and to go to other places. So I definitely enjoy the van. Um, you have anything to say towards that, Mike? Or? Yes, it's, it's a it's beautiful uh, rap van that, that really helps us advertise as we go around the city as well. So if you see it, just give us a wave. I get it mentioned to me often that, that the CMTV van is seen cruising around. So it, it is like a mobile billboard, most especially. Um, that's the end of our, our planned presentation. We certainly are available. I have the team here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, again, I just want to um, just communicate how appreciative we are for all of the support that the city has given us um, and the belief in the crew that um, is obviously very talented in, in doing their work. So thank you all. Yeah. Thank you all. I've had several chances to appear on television shows produced there. And what I, it struck me is that the staff really got the producers up to speed. You know, the staff wasn't doing it. They had trained them. So that means they have taught mm -hmm. people how to fish in terms of television production. And you guys have done a great job and great equipment. So thanks, everyone, for doing thanks that. Thanks, have. And um, we'll let you go and look forward to hearing from you next time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank have you. Have a good evening. All right. That brings us to our legislative agenda for this evening. And we start out with a special budget ordinance. Would you like to do the appointments first? Or we could do the appointments first. <laughs> so thank you so much. We have um, uh, three reappointments, if you'd like to read those, Terry. Okay. Reappointment of Jennifer West to the Spokane Airport Board to serve a mm -hmm. three-year term from January 1, 2022 to December 31, 2024 and reappointment of Grant Shipley and Taylor Stevens to the Bicycle Advisory Board to serve a three-year term from December 1, 2021 to November 30, 2024. All those in favor of those reappointments, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, the three of you are all reappointed. Thanks so much for your service. We depend on it. If you out there watching are interested in serving on a city board or commission, we have a web page, City of Spokane Boards and Commissions, that has all of them and what the current vacancies are and what they do, and you can apply to the mayor's office. If you're interested, the mayor uh, picks nominees and then council uh, confirms them. So thanks for that. And now we'll go to the special budget ordinance. Ordinances amending ordinance number C35971 passed by the City Council December 14, 2020, entitled An Ordinance Adopting the Annual Budget of the City of Spokane for 2021, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2021, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage, and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in Ordinance C36145, Asset Management Capital Fund, number one, increased revenue by $250,000, A. $250,000 of the increased revenue represents a transfer in from the general fund. Two, increase expenditures by $250,000. A, 
A, $250,000 of the increased expenditure is provided solely for capital improvements to the Cannon Street shelter, including the addition of supplementary shelter structures on the premises to be used for providing shelter to persons who have been exposed to COVID-19. This action allows for capital improvements to the Cannon Street shelter. And we have one member of the community that would like to speak about this, and that's Nicolette Ockeltree. Nicolette, if you would like to hit star three. Welcome to City Council, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, and good evening. How much has been spent to date on that building? I mean, I'm talking uh, the cost of the purchase, the remodel, repair, to get it all up to date and up to code. I know that this question has been asked by me several times. It was asked by Councilman Cathcart during a uh, briefing session or study session, and I'm just not sure that question has been answered. When I tried to do a rough calculation on my own using the uh, real estate affidavit and looking at past uh, city council agendas, my calculation is that tonight, after this approval, it'll be well over $2 million. And that doesn't include any operating costs. It just includes the purchase of the building and uh, all the costs of, of repairs and remodels. And I do think that I'm missing a big chunk of, what, of that cost. Um, so if we could actually get that answered, I think that would be uh, fantastic um, for the transparency of everything. Um, I also see here that this is essentially supposed to not only be for capital improvements on the building itself, but also to allow for uh, outside uh, isolation structures. I'm a little bit confused by this because I was under the impression that the Spokane Regional Health, Health District and the county um, put together a contract with Salvation Army for isolation facilities. And so I'm not sure why those aren't sufficient. And furthermore, it doesn't make sense. I have been told that these are RVs that are these outside structures. And if that's the case, then it doesn't make sense to me why they can house uh, COVID positive or exposed patients in RVs, but an average citizen cannot do that. Um, it just, it seems clearly hypocritical. If it's, if it's good enough for them to be able to do and that's safe, then average citizens should be able to, you know, uh, have that available uh, as an option for their family members that might need to be uh, isolated. Also, it doesn't seem to indicate how many COVID patients will be able to fit in there. Um, it just seems like there's a lot of questions looming here. And I know it's going to get approved anyway, but I feel like we need to be asking more of these questions of the administration and demanding that they come back to us with these answers before these things get voted on and before more money is given to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I see Council Member Capcart. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to share, uh, I did get some numbers from the administration, uh, from Tanya. And so I just thought I'd share those with everybody. So 407,532 for the purchase in 2019, uh, 1,246,140 for remodel work in 2020. Uh, and then, and that puts us at 1.6. And then with the 250,000 being asked for now, that would put us at about 1.9 million. And there's an asterisk that there's that other work may not have been considered a, a capital cost. So it's possible there's some other money that's been invested in the building that's not accounted for in in those uh, line items. But I did get that from from Tanya this morning, and so I wanted to make sure and, and share that that we do have that information. I continue to think that I mean I, I get it. We don't really have a lot of other options. This is kind of what we have to do at this point. But if you could rewind the tape, the amount of money that we've put into this structure, I feel like we probably could have done something bigger and better um, in some other way. So it, it's unfortunate we can't go back in time, but, but there's not a lot of money put into this building. Thank you for getting those numbers for us. Uh, I see Council Member Wilkerson. Thank you. And I certainly hear um, our community member, Nicolette, and my fellow councilman, Michael Catcart. The challenges we did by that building, we could go back in time. I don't know what the condition was, and we have invested in it, but the city owns it. Uh, it, is our, it has become our responsibility to maintain it safely as long as we are operating a shelter out of it. And as in any old building, our reality may be that it will have ongoing issues 
that may be coming before council. I had just a quick conversation with the facilities maintenance guy, and already there's some chatter about a roof. So um, I will support it. Um, we need to look at that tighter controls and, and what's our long-term game in that building going forward. Councilmember Stratton. Can anyone tell me this, for how many people, how many people does the Cannon shelter hold? Do we, I know when I was there, it didn't seem, what, 30? It, it's Is it more than that? Under 100. I think it's 60. Under 100, I think it's 60 or 70. I, I, I was thinking 60, Councilmember Kinnear. 60, okay. I think it's over 70 now. It, it was at okay. 60, and then they did some remodeling, and they increased the spaces. Uh, it now has showers, but I want to say it was between 70 and 80. Okay. I thought it was smaller than that. Thanks. All right. Any other council commentary? All right. Seeing and hearing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. I count seven to zero. How about the next special budget ordinance? Ordinance C-36-146, Asset Management Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $133,000. A, $133,000 of the increased appropriation is provided solely for emergency capital outlay and machinery and equipment expenses. B, the increase in appropriation is from the Asset Management Fund's unappropriated reserves. This action allows for the purchase of a replacement boiler for Fire Station 1. We don't have any requested community comment on this one. Is there any council commentary? All right. Council Member Wilkerson. Um, Chief Schaefer sent us all the video of the boiler, and it was very disturbing and unsafe. Um, we can share that with the community, but we have to address that boiler issue immediately. That was truly a picture's worth a thousand words video. So that was good. All right, I will have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Passes seven to zero. And we have another special budget ordinance, which, if I understand it correctly, it's mostly a bookkeeping one, but go ahead, Ms. Fister. Okay. Ordinance C36147, general fund number one, decreased revenue by $1,575,000. A, $1,575,000 of the decreased revenue represents the estimated amount that was to be reimbursed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The reimbursement will shift to the Arterial Street Fund. Two, decrease appropriation by $1,575,000. A, $1,575,000 of the decreased appropriation was provided to the Engineering Services Department solely for the purpose of emergency work related to the Clark Avenue landslide. The emergency work will shift to the Arterial Street Fund. An arterial street fund number one increased revenue by $2,100,000. A, $1,575,000 of the increased revenue represents the estimated amount to be reimbursed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. B, $525,000 of the increased revenue represents a transfer in from the general fund. Two, increase appropriation by $2,100,000. A, $2,100,000 of the appropriation is provided solely for the purpose of emergency work related to the Clark Avenue landslide. This action funds necessary operation expenses related to the emergency situation created by the Clark Avenue landslide. Thank you. And there's no request to community comment. Any council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. 
Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. And then we have two very small, well, excuse me. We have another special budget ordinance, which is quite small, but go ahead. Ordinance C36148, Ironbridge TIF Debt Service Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $200. A, $200 of the increased appropriation is provided solely for debt payment. Mm -hmm. And University District LRF Debt Service Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $1. A, $1 of the increased appropriation is provided solely for debt payment. And Gulf Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $340,745. A, $340,745 of the increased appropriation is provided solely for other improvements, including roof and HVAC replacement. This action allows for adjusting appropriation authority and selected funds. Again, there's no community comment on this one. Is there any council commentary? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. Another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36149, General Fund, number one, decrease the appropriation for the probation officer one position in the Community Justice Services Department by $12,545. Two, increase the appropriation for operating lease in the Community Justice Services Department by $12,545. Three, decrease the appropriation level for the court clerk one position in the Municipal Court Department by $77,500. Four, increase the appropriation level for operating lease in the Municipal Court Department by $77,500. There is no change to the appropriation level in the general fund. This action allows for increasing the operating lease budget to pay the 2020 Public Safety Building and Courthouse Annex joint use rent. There's no community comment. Essentially, uh, this takes care of our lease to the county for our uh, public safety and, and courtrooms over there, and the charges are not predictable and they're kind of lagging from past years and then they bring them to us and so we're paying for the increased amount for this year that we owe by uh, taking money from vacant positions. Uh, with that we'll go to a roll call. Councilmember Mump. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. That passes 7 to 0, and we have one more special budget ordinance. Ordinance C 36150, Fire EMS Fund. Number one, increase revenue by $756,812. A, revenue received by the department as reimbursement of costs incurred responding to regional fire mobilizations. Two, increase appropriations by $756,812. A, increase in appropriations to offset costs incurred responding to regional fire mobilizations, B, costs related to overtime backfill and travel lodging. This action allows for funding of unbudgeted costs related to responding to regional wildfire mobilizations. All right, there's no requested community comment. Any council commentary? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. That passes seven to zero. Um, there was one emergency ordinance listed, but it was not going to be voted on today. It's deferred till next Monday. And uh, now we're at resolutions and final reading ordinances. 
Resolution 2021-91, approving the Spokane Employees Retirement System Board's change in the employee and employer contribution rates in accordance with Spokane Municipal Code 4.14.070, deferred from November 1, 2021 agenda. And again, there's no community comment requested. Is there any council commentary? Councilmember Mum. I uh, want to uh, thank the staff that helped uh, look at this and the other council members and um, the SERS board. Um, I'm really against uh, raising this right now, um, but after listening to the board and the situation that the pension is in, uh, we pretty much need to do it. Not only do we need to increase it now, but we also need to shore it up. And so I'm hopeful that uh, this will carry on uh, through the next year and there will be a dedicated funding mechanism to shore this up for the long term. It's an obligation that um, the city gladly pays for its hardworking employees, yet uh, overall when we look at the health of the city to have a pension funded so low compared to others around the state, it does, I think, put us at a little bit of a disadvantage uh, for the health of the um, city finances. So I think the best outcome, even though this, I will support this now, um, even though we would have a raise this year, it would be reimagined uh, next year with fresh data. And if there was a, a way to allocate um, some of the uh, unfilled salaries that had pledge in a way uh, to be contributing to the SERS fund that might help alleviate increases in the future. So I hope um, everyone can work on that uh, later, but it's something that the city needs to take care of um, in the long run to get our pensions funded up uh, over well over 80 and even 90%. Thank you. Any other council commentary? All right. And let's have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. Next resolution. Resolution 2021-98, forming an ad hoc equity subcommittee of the City Council's Finance and Administration Committee. All right, we don't have any requested community comment. Councilmember Wilkerson, do you want to tee this up? Thank you very much. I was ready. So this subcommittee, equity and inclusivity is called out throughout the City of Spokane's Comprehensive Plan, Chapter 10, which states the role of us in improving the well-being of individuals and families, communities, addressing factors, we all know those. But over the past two years, we have seen what many of us already knew, that the existing inequities put at risk the health and safety of our communities. COVID put the spotlight on the inequities and the importance for us in government to build relationships and to create programs and policy in collaboration with communities impacted by inequities. So this uh, subcommittee will be advisory. This will allow us to have other voices. And even tonight, we have heard the word inequities. And how do we as government start standing up to make sure we operationalize community members to have a voice. It is missing. I'm hoping that we will partner with the administration. Uh, I don't know if they have this type of voice on their side of the house, but as council, it's very important. And it's under the finance committee because everything we do always has some type of financial component to it that really affects the outcome. So it's the old adage, you can tell our priorities by where we spend our money. So I'm in support of this tonight. It is in its infancy. We'll be standing up 
growing it, um, and we'll be inviting all those who want us to be a part of it uh, to be a part of it. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I've after after really trying to think it through today, especially I, I've really come to the conclusion that I'm going to vote no. And and the reason is twofold. One is, as was pointed out in the opening of our, our meeting tonight, the Human Rights Commission serves as an advisory body to the city council. And and I think they're doing this work already. And so I, I, I really feel that to do this would be duplicative of that. But furthermore, and, and really at the heart of why I, I have concerns, is that I think one of the things we really need to emphasize is geographic equity. And there's no provision in this resolution for geographic equity. In fact, it leaves it out. And so I, I really believe that Northeast Spokane needs equity. Uh, it has, at least before COVID, brought in more sales tax probably than any other district. And yet it didn't necessarily always get the same or, or, or more as it should uh, of, the, of the spending on you know, projects and parks and things like that over, and not, not over the last few years, but over a long period of time. And so I, I just really think that if we're going to focus on equity, that's an area of equity that also deserves a focus. And there is no uh, committee or subcommittee that's looking at, at that specific type of issue. And so I'm going to vote no because I think that there should be a provision for geographic equity, standing up parts of our community that have been underserved, undersupported for a very long time. Um, and, and this goes beyond... Um, uh, race or anything else, uh, but I think it's something that we need to focus on. And so um, to emphasize that, that's why I'm voting no on this tonight. Councilmember Burke. Thank you. And thanks, Councilmember Walkerson, for bringing this forward. Um, I'll just go ahead and say that uh, District 1 is definitely some uh, district that's uh, forgotten about oftentimes in the budget. And it's not because of its location in the city, it's because of the people who live in it. And we have the majority of people of color and the majority of people of poverty. So this will inevitably help District 1 by putting this together because um, it will help the people of color and it will help people who are in poverty, which is going to be District 1. So very, very supportive of it. And um, thank you for bringing it forward. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. And I just want to state in the resolution, it does say citywide. You are not specific. It is the whole city because these challenges exist. So we did not put in a specific demographic area. We set the city of Spokane. Any other comments? Okay, we'll go to a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Nay. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to one. And that brings us to another resolution. Resolution 2021-97, improving an extension of a development re agreement regarding the preliminary plat and plan unit development referred to as the VISTAs at Beacon Hill, deferred from the November 22nd, 2021 agenda. All right, so a week ago we were looking at this and we were, our lawyer was negotiating with the developer's lawyer about uh, setting aside some land or arranging for a park and ride, and uh, they worked on that agreement and that language, um, along with uh, making sure the streets were built to public street standards, um, and that making it an extension for three years to get all their plans in instead of five years. So those were some changes from the original extension. Uh, we have one member of the public who has signed up to testify and that's Brennan Mayer. Brennan, if you're there, hit star three. All right, Brennan, welcome back to City Council. You have up to three minutes. 
Thank you. Yeah, my name is Brennan Mayer. I work for DTJ Design. I'm just uh, calling in to answer any questions that uh, if the council members have. Uh, if there's any remaining questions, I just wanted to make myself available uh, you know, to, to smooth that out. So that's all I have to say. If there's anything that you would like me to address, let me know. All right. So thanks, Brennan. Does anyone have any more questions for Brennan? All right. Really appreciate you making yourself available. Uh, any council commentary? I saw Council Member Kinnear first, then Council Member Mum. I wanted to thank James Richmond for being so flexible and working to get this through, to get these changes. Also, uh, the developer who is willing to make these changes to set aside the land for a park and ride. I think it's important that when we have development that is not near a center corridor, this is one mile from a bus stop, that we accommodate people without forcing them to own or drive a car. So I just wanted to acknowledge that a, a lot of work went into making those changes um, that I believe are necessary for a development at this size. So I wanted to thank everybody. You, Council Member Mum. I want to thank um, the council people and the staff that worked to make lemonade out of a lemon here. And I know people worked really hard to do it, but I won't be supporting this because it doesn't is not consistent with the comp plan. And I don't think it's really our job to cut deals with developers. I think that uh, next time this comes up, if there's a development agreement, we should send it back to the hearing examiner. That's why we hire a professional hearing examiner who's a professional attorney. I think it was tough on the developers who were trying to reach out to individual council members. And it's just not appropriate for us to get into the weeds on this kind of thing. And so that's just my recommendation in the future. From a process point of view, I just looked into the development uh, agreement code. Those things can go on in perpetuity. They basically freeze the plans at the time um, that they were put together, which was the mid-2000s. It could go on forever. You can extend this forever as a council. And I just don't think that's the intent of the law. And I hope you can maybe look at that and change that in the future as well, that a development agreement is going to expire and not have this perpetual extension because it puts the council in a really rocky place and, you know, you get brushed with, oh, you're anti-development or you're anti-density. No, that's not it at all. It's about fairness and what's fair and the new codes. And so I think the council um, that's supporting this put together a pretty good package, but just from a process point of view, I, I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Wilkerson. Uh, thank you. I will be supporting it, but I have to say my first time going to do this, uh, that horse trading at the bottom of the night uh, at the last meeting was really uncomfortable where lawyers were basically emailing back over the phone at the last minute. We postponed them on the agenda, uh, and it did not feel right. So I support this. The work has gone into it, but... I have to admit with council member mom, we need a better process than the one we had on this one going forward. Council member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, grateful that we're getting this over the finish line and hopefully we'll see some housing come out of this. Any other commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Nay. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Councilmember Burke. Nay. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. Passes five to two. We have a couple more ordinances. Well, a few more ordinances after during the hearings, but now we're to first reading ordinances. Ordinance C thirty six one fifty one, updating the framework for the downtown parking and business improvement area, amending Spokane Municipal Code sections four point thirty one point zero two zero point three zero point 
.040, and .140. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinance. All right, we're gonna go to our hearings of our annual comprehensive plan updates, and we have a few people signed up to testify about them. Uh, make sure that you're on the phone because there's a pretty uh, long lag in the video, so you don't wanna depend on that. And again, when I call on you, hit star three, and then I'll invite you to speak for up to three minutes. And when you're done, please hit star three again, so that unraise, uh, lowers your hand and makes it easier to keep track of who's, who's next. Um, I believe Mr. Kevin Freebot is going to um, tee us up on the first one, and then we'll take any commentary and a vote, and then we'll go through the rest of them. So welcome to City Council. Absolutely. Council. Did you want me to read it through? Thank oh, you, Council President, yeah. members of the Council. I'm, I'm wrong. I'm going to have, I think I'm going to have Ms. Fister read, maybe just read the first one, I guess. Okay. Yeah. H1A, final reading ordinance 36139 relating to application Z20-194 comp and amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from light industrial to centers and corridors core for approximately 2.5 acres located at 120 North Magnolia Street, parcel 35163.3001 and amending the zoning map from light industrial LI to centers and corridors type one employment center CC1-EC by a vote of eight to zero, the plan commission recommends approval. All right, Kevin, take it away on the ordinance 36139. Thank you, sir. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm gonna go through just a couple things just for the, the benefit of the public. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to bring you these ordinances today. This is the end of a long road, a 12 to 14 month process that we go through just about every year. Um, and I just wanted to highlight all of the excellent work that's been done by um, city staff and the applicants and of course the public as well throughout this whole process. So we are at the second to last step, which is your hearing for um, all six of the applications this year. And uh, so we'll, we'll briefly go through them uh, one at a time, as you mentioned. But very quickly, I just wanted to summarize, just as you know, um, we've provided you quite a bit of material. I do apologize for the amount of reading, but these are quite detailed. So you've, you've received findings and conclusions from the plan, uh, plan commission. You've received our staff report, which includes uh, any comments we received prior to the hearing. Uh, there, is an append there is an attachment to all of the staff reports with all of the relevant comp plan policies and, of course, the application materials from each applicant. Uh, you have received all of the comments that we've received thus far um, and also any additional materials that have come up along the way. So uh, just as a reminder, as you start to think about your, uh, your decisions on these, the, the Municipal Code Section 17G, which guides comp comprehensive plan amendments, does provide a number of options for council. Obviously, you can approve. Um, you can consider, continue the consideration for another meeting. Uh, you can remand items back to plan commission for their input. Um, that does require that you include a deadline for when they should get back to you. And, or you can also modify proposals, uh, which, as you recall, last year, a couple of them were modified by council at the end. Um, or, of course, you can vote to deny. And so those are the options laid out in the municipal code. Um, and, of course, uh, Mr. Richmond is here to answer questions if we get into details there. Um, an overview very quickly, we've got five amendments to the land use plan map. These were all submitted as private applications during last year's application process and they are scattered uh, around the, pretty much the core of the city. Um, and then of course we have a last application, That's, that one is a change to the bike map in chapter four. That's a city sponsored application. Uh, so that one came out of, out of our office with Mr. Quinn Hurst uh, through consultation with the Bicycle Advisory Board and with neighborhoods and others. So the first one is ordinance 6139. This one, uh, the public would know as file Z20194 COMP. It relates to the one single parcel at 120 North Magnolia. Uh, this is about two and a half acres. This is the um, historic McKinley School building is on this site, as well as a, um, a small, uh, more recent warehouse you can see on the, on the west end of the site. Um, the, the proposed land use for this is, of course, CC Core, which would combine it with the Centers and Corridors Core area to the south along Sprague. And the proposed zoning is Centers and Corridors Type 1, 
an employment center, which again would match the center to the south. Staff's recommendation on this one was for approval. Plan Commission also voted unanimously to recommend approval of this one. And just as a quick reminder, this is currently designated light industrial and the applicant is hoping to fold it into the CC core along Sprague. The zoning would of course go from light industrial to CC1 EC. So those are the very basic details. Um, at this point, uh, I believe Mr. Hume is probably on the phone waiting to speak. Then he is the applicant's agent for this proposal. Yes, yeah, so we only have one person signed up to speak, and that is Mr. Dwight Hume on behalf of the applicant. Uh, Dwight, if you'd like to hit star three. All right, welcome to City Council, Dwight. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, yes, what has been presented to you by staff is uh, certainly accurate. And I would just add to that that not only do we have unanimous support of the Planning Commission, we actually had anxious support for this approval from uh, neighboring uh, industrial users who are just tired of seeing the the uh, rundown appearance of and and no activity. Uh, on this property, so they're they're hoping against hope that this will be uh, the cure to finally see some improvements to the neighborhood. And that's all I have to add. Thank you so much, Dwight. Um, any council commentary? Go ahead and just volunteer. Council President. Council Member Wilkerson. I'm in support of this. I have to say, I say it a lot. I grew up four blocks from this school. I'm too young to have attended McKinley, but I had neighbors who did, where that was a very vibrant neighborhood on that block. My grandmother lived on the next corner. There was a house on a little hill, and to see it in the state that is in now is sad. So I support the redevelopment of this. I think it will be an asset. Uh, to the East Spread Corridor and to the neighborhood and to the vibrancy that could happen down there. All right. Uh, any other council commentary? All right. Seeing none, we'll go to a roll call. Uh, Mr. Hume, if you could hit that star three, that'll lower your hand and make it easier for us to call on the next person. But let's have a council roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. And Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes seven to zero. That brings us to hearing B, Ordinance 36140, which uh, Ms. Fister will read. Final reading ordinance C36140 relating to application Z20-206 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to residential 1530 for approximately 3.9 acres located at 155, 173, 177, 203, 203 and a half, 209, 215, 221, 227, 301, 305, 317, 327, and 403 East Cleveland Avenue. Parcels 3508 2.0919 through 0 .0933. And amending the zoning map from residential single family RSF to residential multifamily RMF. By a vote of 6 to 2, the Plan Commission recommends approval. All right. Kevin? Absolutely. So this one uh, is the application on East Cleveland Avenue. We're talking about just east of Division. You can't see it on this uh, aerial, but it is just below the bluff. So um, this, uh, let's see if I can turn on my pen here. This, this line you see going diagonally just behind the parcels is the bluff. So that kind of gives you an idea where we're talking about. It is 15 parcels of 3.9 acres. The original application was for this one parcel you see on the west end on North Mayfair Street. So that part of it is a private application. However, during uh, the processing of this application, Plan Commission voted to expand it 
to include the additional 14 parcels. So this is one of our combined private and city sponsored applications. The proposed land use again is residential 15 to 30. That's kind of our middle of the range residential density um, with a proposed zoning of residential multifamily. You'll see here for staff recommendation, there's little stars. That's because uh, staff did recommend approval of the private application, the single parcel to the west. However, um, we did not issue a recommendation for the remainder of the project area. Uh, Plan Commission did vote to recommend approval and they recommended this additional area as well. Um, so just showing you again the land use plan map, what we have here is uh, this is a strip of single family residential along Cleveland with residential 15 to 30 to the west. Uh, this proposal would add that, uh, add all of this into that residential 15 to 30 you see is a, that runs kind of along the general commercial to the south and to the west. The zoning of course would do similar, a residential multifamily to the west and it would line that up and, and, and match everything west of Mayfair here. So that's what I've got for this one. Thank you. Any council commentary on this amendment? I do. This is Lori. Um, Kevin, just to reiterate, there's a natural transition zone here because what isn't obvious is the houses to the north are on a bluff. So there's no, it's a natural area where there's a, um, an obvious separation. Let's just put it that way. That, that's correct. The bluff, the bluff averages about 70 feet um, all along this area. And uh, the, with a, with a uh, implementing zoning of RMF, it's the 35 foot maximum. And so uh, there is a natural break at that point that kind of um, separates these parcels from those above. There is a connection offered by May Mayfair Street. This is a one way street that goes down the hill. But other than that, they're, they're somewhat separated. Any other commentary? All right, seeing and hearing none. I'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. I just, was there any public testimony? I just saw that it oh, said public I'm testimony. Sorry. There was, and thank you. <laughs> yes. And uh, Lindsay Cornegay, if you would like to hit star three. <laughs> Lindsay, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Kevin as well and to the uh, planning department for their hard work on, on this proposal. Um, I, my name is Lindsay Cornegie again. I represent the landowner here uh, for the original application, as Kevin pointed out, the original application on the, the left-hand side there, that smaller square. So just a few points um, briefly, I'd like to emphasize that the planning department did recommend approval of our initial proposal um, and that the planning, the majority of the planning commission also recommended pr approval of our proposal, uh, proposal, excuse me, after much thoughtful discussion. Um, there was some general agreement regarding the impact this will have on the neighborhood as well as the applicable standards being met in the comprehensive plan. Uh, as you know, policy LU 1.4 of the comprehensive plan states that higher density residential is to be directed to centers and corridors, but that infill is permitted outside of centers and corridors as well in areas where the existing neighboring land use is higher density residential. Here, uh, 155 East Cleveland is bordered by a commercial facility to one side and multifamily housing to another, making the requested change consistent with policy LU 1.4. The designation of these neighboring properties is also what prevents 155 East Cleveland, Cleveland from being an ideal location for a single family home. Uh, we believe that this property's best use is as multifamily and the findings of the staff um, and the planning department found that the area itself has sufficient utilities, streets, and physical features to support a multifamily designation. Um, we believe that this change will have a positive impact as well, not only on the neighborhood by developing what is currently vacant land, but on Spokane generally uh, in our present housing crisis. Putting otherwise vacant land to its highest and best use uh, should be a priority. This property is ideal uh, for infill of multifamily housing, but as mentioned, is not ideal for a single family home. Uh, the developer is, is seeking to put this property to its highest and best use as additional housing for the city and, and the neighborhood that it's in. So thank you all again for your time. Uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, Lindsay. If you could hit star three to lower your hand. 
uh, Council Member Mum. Yeah, thank you. I had just a couple questions. Uh, maybe Kevin and or um, Councilmember Kinnear can answer. Did uh, was there any feedback from the neighborhood at all? Is this Bemis or Logan? Uh, this is Logan, but it's close enough to um, Nevada Lidgerwood that both neighborhoods were, ident were were notified. We did receive quite a few letters. Um, you'll notice in the staff report there's a number of them. Uh, we did receive some after that, uh, prior to the plan commission hearing, some more after the plan commission hearing. Although quite a few of those were um, Xerox copies of older letters, but it has seen a lot of a lot of neighborhood comment, both for and against. Um, I, you know, I, we could count them up if you wanted, but um, definitely a lot of discussion, a lot of concerns about impacts to the neighborhood to the north. But we've also received a few letters that were supportive and thought that that uh, perhaps the proposal should look going further. So. Okay, and then my other question is: there were two dissenting votes here. And if uh, Councilmember Kinnear can recall, or you, uh, Kevin, what that was about, if the, what the issues were, if they were illuminating. Oh, from from the Plan Commission. Um, yeah, the. I do not recall. I, I'm sorry, Councilmember. I couldn't hear you. I I do not recall what the reasoning was. Okay, the. Um, the stated reason for at least one of the, the dissenting votes was that they just felt that this was not um, fully consistent with LU 1.4, that in that it was a little distant from from the Foothill Center, which is to the east. Um, there was uh, a lot of discussion about that uh, back and forth during the workshops, but uh, at the hearing stage, um, only two were voting against it. So. If I could add to Councilman Vermont. To the west is the Ruby Division corridor that was pointed out several times. So um, it, it would be it was odd to me that they were looking to the east for a corridor or a center rather than to the west, which, as you can see, division is just blocks away from that. I think some of the discussion was that division is not a designated corridor on the land use plan map. It is anyone right. anyone who looks at corridors would go, that's a corridor. Yeah, but no. there there there's a distinct uh, capital C corridor in the comp plan and it is not one of those. And so. I guess my point was when talking to the plan commission that there were services on division such as transit and other services that um, higher density could uh, avail themselves of. Other council commentary questions? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Oh. Sorry, I had my hand up. I'm sorry, Council Member Cathcart. <laughs> Thank you for that time. Go ahead. That's okay. Just gonna offer uh, just a quick word of support. I just, I just think this makes sense. As was pointed out, it is really close to division, which yes, not an official corridor. Uh, but also just down, you know, any of these side streets and you're, you're at the Yokes, you're, you're not far from services and things that you would need to have access to. Uh, and so to me, it makes a lot of sense. It's going to provide us some more housing and uh, which is desperately needed. So I'm, I'm happy to support this tonight. All right. Thank you. Any other council commentary questions? Go ahead and volunteer because I can't see everybody. All right. Hearing none, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burke. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. And that brings us to the next ordinance. H1C final reading ordinance C36141 relating to application file Z20-207 comp amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 410 to general commercial for approximately 0.16 acres located at 1015 West Montgomery Avenue parcel 3507.3.2505 and amending the zoning map from residential single family RSF to centers and corridors type 2 district center CC2-DC by a vote of eight to zero, the plan commission recommends approval. All right, 
Kevin, tell us about this. Thank you. Uh, so this is file 207 comp. Uh, we're talking about a single parcel of just under 0.2 acres. Uh, however, the, the same owner owns the uh, parcels to the east and the parcels to the south. So their overall ownership is 0.7 acres. Um, the reason that's really worth mentioning is that that is the area that we base our notification off of. So it's, you know, it's 400 feet from that wider area. However, the only actual change is to this one property that currently, home, uh, currently contains a home that's being used uh, as multifamily housing. So uh, the proposed land use would be general commercial, which would make all of the adjoining uh, uh, parcels match uh, in their land use. And the zoning would be centers and corridors type two, district center. Just a note, this is in a corridor. Uh, corridors are typically zoned district center, which is why the, the, we don't have a center, or we don't have a corridor zoning, it's just district center zoning. Uh, staff's recommendation following all of the analysis was, of course, to recommend approval of this one. Plan Commission also recommended unanimously for approval. Uh, you did receive uh, a couple of letters on this one and there was some discussion. Just to show you the maps again, give you some context, we're talking about uh, right next to General Commercial along North Monroe Street. This would, of course, make all of these parcels owned by the same individual uh, match in their land use map designation of General Commercial. The zoning is, the entire entirety there is uh, CC2DC along North Monroe. This would make this match that. So it's currently single family, but it would be centers and corridors. Type 2 district center. And that's all I have. All right. Uh, I've got two people to testify from the public, but are there any questions for Kevin from council? All right. Not seeing any. So the, I have two people, Eric Ianelli and Dwight Hume. Uh, Eric, if you're there, if you want to hit star three. All right. Eric, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hi, my name is Eric Ionelli. Uh, I live about a block and a half from the property in question. Um, I, it's hard to know where to begin because the situation um, on paper looks very, very straightforward. It's a almost insignificant formality uh, and that it's a land use change. Um, but the situation on the ground is considerably more fraught in that the, by changing this land use, um, it allows the same developer to kind of set up plans. It starts a, a sequence of dominoes, really, that allows the developer to develop this, uh, this adjacent um, parcel of land. And the reason that's an issue is because this same developer, as Kevin pointed out, also owns the Lloyd Apartments, um, which sits kind of to the, to the south of this property. And certainly within the past uh, two years, but I would say it probably extends a bit further in, into the past than that, the Lloyd has become a real blight on the neighborhood. Um, it just I pass it at least twice a day, walking my daughter to and from school, um, there are drug deals going on uh, out the windows, you know, people chucking up rocks, um, packages coming down. Um, the, two front, the two windows on the front doors have been smashed out for one for a month, the other for two weeks. No attempt at repair has been made. Um, the building is falling into disrepair. Um, the owner usually uh, has said that this all comes down to a few problem tenants, but in my talks with other neighbors and other business owners, the excuse um, is kind of like the check is in the mail or my dog ate my homework. It seems to be one that's been routinely used. And so um, the general feel, fear among both business owners in the immediate area as well as neighbors um, who've had to deal with a lot of the issues uh, caused by the Lloyd, its tenants, and the lack of control um, is that this is going to be Lloyd too and we're going to have um, a, a massive devolution in the quality of life uh, at the end of Mansfield and Montgomery when this other property is developed. Um, and so I would just implore the council, even though this seems like such a, a, a formality, um, I would implore the council to maybe de decline temporarily and, and vote nay on this um, until the situation at the Lloyd has been resolved sat satisfactorily. Um, for neighbors and business owners. Um, I know Council Member Stratton, I've been in communication with you and have given you uh, as much information as I have regarding um, some of the knock-on and residual effects that the activity at the Lloyd has had 
on the surrounding area. So, um, yeah, I would just ask that you politely say nay on in this time around with the caveat that it could be revisited at a future, uh, future date. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And if you could hit star three to lower your hand. Uh, Dwight Hume, if you would like to hit star three to raise your hand. Welcome back to City Council. Dwight, you have up to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the previous speaker is uh, talking about an unfortunate situation that the owner has not caused. As uh, he explained to the Planning Commission, it was largely a part of losing control of uh, uh, tenants during COVID. And I'm not exactly sure of all the uh, agencies that have been involved, but uh, he's very sensitive to that issue. Uh, notwithstanding, it is presumptuous to say that we're doubling the size of the problem by your actions to approve this. More importantly, this does, uh, as staff said and as the Planning Commission agreed, it squares up the commercial uh, uh, corridor designation and enables uh, the property, uh, the subject property, which contains a, a, a home of over 100 years old, to be torn down and replaced uh, with something that uh, most likely would be a combination retail and residential, but certainly something that would be up to code. Uh, the centers and corridor uh, policies uh, are such that this is simply an implementation of what was intended by the adoption of centers and corridors. I have nothing else to add. Thank you, Dwight. And go ahead and hit star three to lower your hand. Uh, any council commentary? Council Member Stratton. Thank you. I'm going to stand with EJ tonight. Um, I have had meetings with the neighbors that live on Mansfield and Montgomery and the businesses that are along that Monroe corridor on the same side. I'd had meetings with the um, developer, the owner, who was very, very um, nice and gracious to come to a meeting that the neighbors called to talk about these issues. and. My big concern is that we can talk, and I've, I've learned so much from Councilmember Mom on um, planning and, and centers and corridors, and, but at what point do we stop and say, the yeah, this is a great project for centers and corridors, but it's also affected his, his, um, his earlier projects have affected those businesses. So we have business owners that have these people who um, are gathering around and not being um, policed out. Um, they're sleeping in their uh, parking lots and in their alleys and in their door um, on the row and opening the door openings. This property on Mansfield is now, just so everybody knows, in a chronic nuisance um, state with FPD um, and um, we've also involved Matt Folsom, who's been working or trying to work with the developer. My concern is that um, this is my old neighborhood. I know that neighborhood. Um, I'm certainly not against more development in that neighborhood. What I'm concerned about is that the fear that the neighbors right now have on those two blocks, because it's connected, because this, this venture is connected and the develop, it's the same person that they're dealing with. Um, I have been told by neighbors that um, this is a hot spot. I know that there was an incident with um, individual, two individuals, one had a gun um, and some kids were playing on a trampoline and the gun was flying in the air. Um, we have, I believe, one or two young families that have moved into this neighborhood have left. So what I, this has caused me a lot of angst because if I was one of those young families that could afford to buy a home, that's going to be the neighborhood in Northwest Spokane that you can still afford to buy homes and they're older homes, big older homes, and I have my family settled and now I'm afraid to 
let them outside without having, you know, to watch them 24 seven. And then I find out that we're going to allow um, development of, of this area. I've lost trust in the city. I'm scared to death and I'm going to leave. And they have lost um, families in that neighborhood. It's not a good situation right now. I have to say publicly that it, it was amazing to me that we had neighbors, some business owners, and the landlord who sat down and talked with us for probably two hours trying to come up with some solutions. I'm not seeing them. I'm still driving through that neighborhood checking them out. There was a business that was across the street from the Lloyd. They've left, so it's an empty building. And if you go there on certain days, there are um, sleeping bags, needles, bottles, everything there. So this is not, I also want to say, um, this is not personal against the landlord at all. I've met him. I have absolutely no problem with him. But I do worry that um, we're inflicting more on this neighborhood and we're not giving um, the developer enough time to prove to this neighborhood and to these businesses that that apartment, the Lloyd, can be cleaned up. I was just there, drove by last week. The door was a jar with a beer can in it so people could come and go. They're supposed to be locked at all times, but people were coming and going. Um, so I, I just, I don't want to do this to a neighborhood, any neighborhood, but I feel very responsible. This is a neighborhood in my district, and I, I want to support um, their fears. And I want to be able to say that we've listened and that maybe right now isn't the time for this. Let's give this process the year to get cleaned up. It's a mess. Um, you can talk to the, some of the businesses and some of those, those homeowners, some of those parents of those kids that walk two blocks to Trinity Catholic School. Um, I would like to give this time to settle down for the developer to prove that um, he can do business in, in a neighborhood and a business in corridor and be a good neighbor. Um, so uh, for, for those reasons, I'm not going to support this, but I, I just want everybody to know it's, it's more because I don't want to put this neighborhood through any more than they've already been put through. And recently this has been going on about a year. So I can imagine how tired they must be. Thank you, Councilmember Mum, and then Councilmember Kapkar. So here's what gives me pause, and thank you, um, Councilmember Stratton, for all the time you've invested um, and the listening and working with the neighborhood on this. This is taking a residential single family house to commercial. It's taking it from the lowest density to all, one of the highest with no transition, which is part of why we have this conflict and we've identified this as an issue uh, in our community where we have you know um, a lot of activity or commercial areas that butt right up against um, single family we need to have these transition zones and we've talked about it we've asked the plan planning department to do it. we've asked the administration for funding these projects it's coming um, we've got potentially ARPA money coming for some of these things and I I'm going to vote with my seatmate and just take a pause on this. It needs a greater approach, not just for this one lot. It needs an approach for the whole area because these kinds of conflicts will continue to come up unless we do better job planning and helping the transition from the growing um, commercial and industrial areas that are creeping into our RSF. Yes, we want the development, but not at the expense of our community and our neighborhood. Thank you. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really uh, sympathetic to what Council Member Stratton is saying. And, and it's, it's really frustrating to see that we have the continuation of problems like these in, in certain uh, apartment complexes, certain houses, certain uh, areas in our community. I know I've got a few in Northeast Spokane that no matter how hard you try to deal with them, it seems like you just cannot shut them down. And so I, I really think the answer 
is swifter and steeper penalties for folks who operate or own nuisance homes. Uh, to me, that is the direction that we really need to go in. We need to have real penalties for um, uh, operating these in our community. And so that's the direction I would like to go. I think we need something on that end. I would even support, and I, I brought this up uh, this morning uh, to some others, including Councilmember Stratton, some kind of policy that would allow us to uh, freeze a uh, building permit until a nuisance complaint has been dealt with. I think something like that, because you're right, if you operate one, you might operate others. But I think the zoning itself is a little bit bigger than a landlord or bigger than an owner, um, has bigger ramifications and impacts on the community at large. Um, future owners could do something with it. So I, I think it's a little bit different. And so I, I think if we're going to do something to try and clean up this site, I just don't think the zoning aspect is the right place to do it. I, I think it would be on the building permit or some other provisions that we can work on. And I would very much support working on something like this. I think going after, you know, landlords that operate buildings that, that are not uh, uh, up to standard, I, I think we should pursue those because they kind of give a bad rap to everybody else. Um, but again, I just think the zoning is a little bit bigger and a little bit different and not the place where we should um, try to, to implement these types of, of ideas or policies. Any other council commentary? Council member Kinnear. So this is, this is really a pickle because um, council member Stratton, you're not an attorney, but you, you just gave a very persuasive argument. So thank you for that. Um, I too don't want to make this about the building or the developer um, in the same vein as Councilmember Cathcart is talking about, we should be dealing with these issues separately and not as part of this package of, of rezoning. And to Councilmember Rum's point, we absolutely do need transition zones. I would like to go ahead with this change and knowing that we're going to be working on transition zones in the future and can if you look at this map, can certainly make the rest of that block into something less dense. So by the time you hop over to, what is that, Madison, the other side of Madison, um, that's your transition into single family. Um, I want to support this because I think it's the destiny of this corridor to be more dense. And I think we can get around the piece about a irresponsible landlord. And I, I even hate to, I prefer not to know who the developers are just for this reason, because I think we should be agnostic when it comes to who is providing, who is asking for a zoning change. So I'm very conflicted. You, you did present a really compelling argument, both Councilmember Mum and Stratton and so, and, and I'm still thinking about it. So, thank you. Council Member Wilkerson. Thank you. Unfortunately, the issues that Council Member Stratton was describing is probably in every neighborhood uh, or many neighborhoods throughout the city. But when you made the comment that it's just been in the last year, um, I, I question if some of the e eviction moratorium had come into play or other legal issues that could have provided some constraints on this landlord uh, to get the people who are challenging out of the building. You know, some of our, or if you receive rental assistance, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things um, that could come into play that I'm not aware of, but it is disconcerting, but again, it, what if this guy, this person sold that land tomorrow? Would it make a difference to you if it was owned by somebody else and they built the same thing? There'd be no um, ability or no guarantees that the new landowner wouldn't have the same problems as the one next door. So 
that's my frustration. Where would the accountability piece come in and who would monitor that to make sure it didn't happen outside of Spokane Police Department and the nuisance ordinance that we have? Councilmember Mum. I want to ask, uh, and I'm putting you on the spot, Kevin, Sir Freibot. Um, when is the uh, Monroe 2.0 study going to be done? Is that on the plan, the work plan? I, I do not know. <laughs> so t I see Terrell popped up, and I think she she might have some input on Terrell, that. Terrell, do you know? Um, we're hoping uh, to start next year, and um, there's a contract that we just uh, have with makers to work on that. Because that might be a deferral we could do until that is done. Um, because the reason I bring that up is because they could come back with a recommendation that general commercial have a transition zone um, between it, and it might, uh, we may be jumping the gun a little bit on this if, if we're looking at the, holistically that corridor. So that's just an idea. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to make that, um, that motion to defer until that study is done. I think that would be um, acceptable to me. I mean, I just, the neighborhood has said to me several times, they don't want to, they're not against this. They just want that time. They want it slowed down. So if there's a fix with the other project, they can see it and they can start having a little more confidence that this is going to be safe and it's going to be something that will not destroy the neighborhood. This is an important intersection to yeah. um, the Monroe Corridor that we've got historic buildings right here. So I, I just, uh, so I, I will make that as a motion uh, to defer until the, um, I guess I'll call it the Monroe Transition Study. What's the title of that, Terrell? I don't know that we've given it a, a formal title, but we're looking at the centers and corridors, um, zoning and the development regulations in, in this area. So what the outcome will be is not yet determined. So I'll just what say the rural planning study is completed. Yeah. I don't know if you want to second that, Council Member Stratton, for discussion. I will second that. Thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded to defer until the Monroe Transition Study is completed. Commentary on the motion. Council Member Burke. Yeah, I just don't agree with this. We can't visualize a parcel for the comp plan change based off of someone who owns the property. That's bias, in my opinion, and we can't do that. Um, and, you know, it, this is in every neighborhood, a multifamily tax, a multifamily to come in and the neighborhood has a reason to hate it, one reason or another. And that's because we don't want density because that equals, people think it equals negativity, it equals uh, drug, drug addicts, all these things. And maybe in some parcels there are people who are addicted to drugs or do cause harm to neighborhoods, and that's just a fact. That does not mean that, you know, certain neighborhoods should be able to say we don't want this specific landlord in this specific place. It's unacceptable. Um, and so I just, I think that this, uh, first of all, we've all stated that we really appreciate the planning commission's work on this and we always support what they put forward to us because we trust that they have put in the work to do it and they did. And now we're saying it's not good enough. And I just think, um, this is, this is a, a year long process and we've had a lot of time to, to talk about it and we haven't brought it up until now. And I just think, um, I think that this, yeah, I agree. Councilmember Wilkerson said it. If this person sold the property tomorrow, would we then be voting yes on it? Um, and if so, that's biased against the landlord, and we shouldn't know who owns the property when making these decisions. It's not appropriate. Other commentary on the motion? Councilmember Mum. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, the, the developer, I'm with you on that, the agnostic piece. I, in fact, I don't even like that, the name of the developer on the document. But just as a history, the whole plan for doing the Monroe Corridor and the improvement was it would be followed right up with a housing action plan. 
kind of a Monroe 2.0. We actually started and we were very excited. Tim and I have worked a lot with this great neighborhood to come up with a way to support the corridor without decimating and bleeding into established areas, knocking down historic buildings, that, that sort of thing, just having a really good plan for this neighborhood. And we were out the door on this, and it got shut down by the administration. This neighborhood got cut off, and then COVID happened, and now finally we're starting back up. And so that's why I'm just thinking, let's Let's hit a pause. We're, in, we're going back for this because we know we need it. And I would just hate for us to go too big with commercial on us without any transition. There might be a better solution to this lot. And so that's why I'm asking just because we have a lot of local knowledge with this. Uh, it's not about the current situation. They're developer for me. Thank you for listening. And I just want to add, Council Member Burke, just because I didn't say it, the neighbors were involved in the hearings and um, they have been in touch with the city regarding these concerns. Um, I, it's very unfortunate that the developer's name was used and I apologize for that. Um, but I, I can tell you that um, I have a great deal of respect for that individual because that developer was willing to sit down with the neighborhood and talk through some of the issues. So I just want to make it very clear that um, it was never my intent to have that name out there. Um, this is not about that person, but this is about trying to slow things down a bit. And again, the neighbors do not um, have a problem with this. They, this is the first time in the last year and a half that I've heard complaints about this building. That building's been there a long time. So I think there's just so many things going on right now, and the neighbors, the neighborhood has asked just that it be slowed down. So I support the, the amendment. And I'll just weigh in. I'm going to vote against the deferral and for the amendment. I totally get the frustration of a problem building. Um, but I don't see the connection between that and the proposed amendment. And it seems that three quarters of that section of the block are already zoned this way, so it just squares it off. And I look at the map at the other properties, and my sense is that Monroe, north and south, for quite a ways, is going to be at least half a block uh, multifamily or commercial, if not the whole block. Um, and so I, I think, in fact, probably just the opposite. Squaring up that block would allow the owner to develop something more interesting because he or she would control that. But I would just prefer to move forward. Um, any other comments on the motion to defer? Okay, motion to defer. Uh, all those in favor, uh, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, and oppose nay? Nay. And I'm a nay, and Councilmember Wilkerson's a nay, and Councilmember Cathcart, you're, I can't see everyone, so are you a nay? Nay. And Councilmember Kinnear, were you a yay or a nay? I was a, an aye. You were an aye, okay. So I believe it was three ayes and four nays on the motion to defer. So council member, mom. Can I just have a point of privilege on a comment? <laughs> yes. Um, but go ahead and tally. Okay. So I believe and just confirming with people, there were three ayes for the motion to defer and four nays. So the motion would fail. Can I request a roll call on this? You may. <clears throat> I will just go through the roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sine. Council Member Burke. Nay. Council Member Cathcart. Nay. Council Member Wilkerson. Nay. Okay. All right, the nays have it. Um, <clears throat> Councilmember Mum? 
point of personal privilege. Go ahead. Thank you. Just in the future, be careful when you're doing geometry in neighborhoods to square up things. If you know there's a single family home right across now from a general commercial. And so when you're dealing with integration of neighborhoods, single family home, lowest density, general commercial, the highest density, it's where you have the most conflicts. So always remember to look across the street too and Kitty Corner because it's important to the people who have made their homes there. Thank you. Great point. All right. We're now back to the proposed amendment. Any further council commentary on the proposed amendment? All right. Hearing and seeing none, uh, have a roll call on the amendment itself. Starting with Council Member Mum. Nay. Council Member Stratton. So we're voting on the final ordinance, right? Not yes. the amendment. Correct. Okay. Well, it's, I'm voting. Yeah, it's it's, already it's the ordinance that would adopt the amendment, but yes. Oh, okay, yes. Um, so I'm voting no. Okay. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. I believe that is five to two. That brings us to another ordinance proposed amendment. If you'd like to read that, Ms. Fister. H1D final reading ordinance C36142 relating to application file Z20-208 comp and amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 1020 to residential 15 plus for approximately 1.31 acres located at 1014, 1022, 1028 West Cinto Avenue and 1011, 1017, 1023, 1027 West Maxwell Avenue, parcels 35182.2401 through 35182.2407 and 35182.2409 in amending the zoning map from residential two family RTF to residential high density 55 foot max height RHD 55 by a vote of 8 to 0. The plan commission recommends approval. All right, Kevin. Great, thank you. Uh, so this one is on this one's on both West Cinto Avenue and West Maxwell Avenue. We're looking at eight parcels, about 1.3 acres. Uh, essentially, this one also is another split with a private application for these two parcels in the southwest. Uh, this one was expanded at the docketing committee stage way back in February and March of this year. Um, council voted to add the additional um, six parcels, which essentially makes up the western uh, portion of this block. We're looking at a proposed land use of R15+, plus, that's 15 units per acre or more, and a zoning of RHD. However, RHD is typically 35 feet high. This one is 55 feet high. Uh, staff looked at this and recommended approval based on, this, on the criteria. Planning Commission uh, also uh, voted unanimously to recommend approval of this one. To show you the map very quickly, we're talking about the portion of the block that is currently land, designated for land use of residential 10 to 20. Uh, this would uh, raise that to residential 15 plus. You'll notice that matches some of this higher density residential on the east side of Monroe, on the east side of the corridor. So the zoning uh, would go from residential two family or duplex zoning. Uh, it would uh, again go up to a residential high density with a height limit of 55 feet. Uh, again, matching what you see on the east side of the Monroe corridor in this location. And that's what I've got for that, but I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Any questions for Kevin? All right, not hearing any. Um, do you have one? Speaker Dwight Hume, if you want to hit star three. All right, welcome back, Dwight. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. I am uh, don't really have much to add to this. It uh, was enlarged upon by the docketing committee to include all of the uh, westerly portion of the block to a consistent land use potential. Um, formally, years ago, before neighborhood planning, 
it was zoned apartments, hence we have some apartments and sprinkling of uh, uh, multiple tenant uh, houses as conversions. Uh, this just enables uh, a much better opportunity for um, uh, to get ho housing and walkable uh, residential use uh, next to the corridor. And uh, as you can see, it's been unanimously supported by the Planning Commission. And uh, we just uh, trust the council will see the same logic and approve it. That's all I have. All right. Thank you. And if you can go ahead and hit star three to lower your hand. Um, any council commentary on this uh, proposed amendment? All right, not hearing any, and I don't see anyone. Um, we'll go for a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Capcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that's seven to zero. Uh, next ordinance, Ms. Fister. H1E, final reading ordinance C36143, relating to application file Z20-209 comp and amending map LU1 land use plan map of the city's comprehensive plan from residential 1020 to centers and corridors core for approximately 1.9 acres located at 1025 West Spofford Avenue. Parcel 35076.3915 and amending the zoning map from residential two family RTF to centers and corridors type one district center CC1 DC. By vote of eight to zero, the plan commission recommends approval. All right, Kevin. All right. So uh, this one is a, a single parcel at 1025 West Spofford. The entire block is one parcel. So this is the community school, the District 81 property that has been operating as a school for a very long time. Uh, we found, you know, back to the 1890s, there was a school on the site. So it's been a school for a ridiculously long time. Uh, we are looking at just under two acres. The proposed land use for this would be CC Core, which would be consistent with what the corridor has along it in other locations as well. Uh, the, the proposed zoning, you'll see an asterisk here. The applicant's re uh, original request was for a proposed zoning of CC2 District Center, which matches other, um, other center type uh, zoning you see along the Monroe Corridor. However, Plan Commission during their deliberations decided that it was probably more appropriate as a, as a centers and corridors type one. You'll recall type one is more pedestrian oriented. It, it, it doesn't allow car lots or gas stations or drive throughs that kind of thing. Um, so type one is that more pedestrian oriented. Type two is a little more auto accommodating. So plan commission's uh, recommendation is predicated on that being CC type one. Staff looked at uh, this from the criteria and found and recommended approval. Plan Commission recommended approval unanimously with that change to CC Type 1. Uh, looking at the map, this is very similar to the previous one. Uh, it's currently residential 10 to 20 or 10 to 20 units per acre. This time the proposal would be to go to centers and corridors core area. Uh, the zoning is residential two family. And that this, of course, would come up and become part of the, uh, the, the corridor zoning along Monroe Street. CC, on here you see it as CC2 DC. Plan Commission's recommendation was CC1 DC. I just wasn't able to get this, this graphic updated in time. And that's all I have, unless you have questions for me on this one. Any questions for Kevin? Just go ahead and volunteer him. All right, not hearing or seeing any. I don't have anyone signed up, but I just want to make sure that we, if the applicants were on the line, it's the school district, it's uh, Candace Larson and Greg Forsyth. If for some reason you're on and you didn't make it onto our sign up, you could hit star three. Um, but I'm thinking not. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, then let's here if there's any council commentary. All right, hearing and seeing none, we'll have a roll call. Council member Mum. Aye. Council member Stratton. 
Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passed the seven to zero. And that brings us to one more ordinance. H1F, final reading ordinance C36144 relating to proposal file Z21 022 comp and amending comprehensive plan map TR5 proposed bike network map in various locations citywide. By a vote of 8 to 0, the Plan Commission recommends approval. All right, Kevin. All right, so the last one, you made it. <laughs> the last one, the last proposal is an amendment. Uh, now we're in Chapter 4 transportation of the comprehensive plan. This is map TR5, the same map we looked at last year. Um, Mr. Quinhurst apologizes that he, he's ill and is not able to be here tonight, but he has been working on this all year. Unfortunately, he couldn't take it over the finish line tonight. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but what we're looking at are 11 amendments to map TR5, which is the bike, the future bike facilities map in chapter four. Um, so it's important to note that these aren't going to be built tomorrow. This is a, this is a map that identifies targeted improvements for the future. Um, so we're looking at a, a series of new neighborhood gate greenways in the city, uh, some changes related to shared use paths in, in various locations. Those are the blue lines you see on this map and a couple um, new bike lane, uh, new bike lane arrangements, one downtown and one on the South Hill. Um, I, I do want to note on this one, you did receive a comment letter uh, directly on Sunday from, uh, from a member of the public. Uh, I didn't send it to you myself since she had already sent it to you, but uh, it is in the record. I wanted to make sure I highlighted that she squeaked one in there right at the end. So, um, Other than that, if you want to see any of these, I have, I have detailed maps, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Any more questions or comments? We don't have any requested public commentary, so we can go straight to a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. And that is the last of the comprehensive plan amendments. We have one more matter before open forum, and that is the continued hearing on the proposed 2022 budget. And several people have signed up to testify. And I'll read their names so you can get ready. Stacy Tanachev. Rabbi Tamar Molino, Nagmana Sharazi, Pastor Rick Matters, and Nicolette Ockeltree, and Anwar Peace. And so we'll start with Stacy Taninchev. If you're there, if you want to hit star three. All right, Stacy, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh. Good evening, council members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Stacey Tanichev, and I am president of the United Nations Association Spokane chapter, also known as UNA Spokane. I live in Liberty Lake, but I work in the city of Spokane. And I want to congratulate the city on hiring Jarrell Haynes as its first human rights coordinator this year, and on the city council's support for funding three positions in the City of Spokane's 2022 budget. I ask that the City commit to fully staffing and adequately funding the Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion in the 2022 budget. The Spokane community, and especially those from historically marginalized and underrepresented communities, have waited too long for an office to address concerns about discrimination and hate crimes, as well as to conduct other things that Dr. Lamb uh, talked about and Curtis Robinson addressed such as educating the community and city staff on issues of equity and inclusion. And based on the proposal sent to you by Spokane Progress, UNA Spokane, and many other organizations that Dr. Lamb referenced earlier, I ask that you fund six staff positions and provide the adequate funding for such an office to be effective, which based on comparable size cities would be a minimum of slightly over $1 million. 
The city of Spokane, as you know, has much to be proud of, but unfortunately it faces the presence of white nationalist groups and the racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, and homophobic hate crimes that these groups carry out, um, as mentioned also by Mr. Robinson earlier. But perhaps harder to pinpoint and address are the unseen ways in which ideas counter to the equality, equity, and inclusion of all people lead to discrimination in housing, employment, and policymaking. And changing laws alone will not change this. In some ways, we're all part of a system that perpetuates this discrimination, but we may not even be aware um, when it's happening. And this is why training for city staff and for community organizations and the public are necessary to achieve change. Um, this is just one more reason why the city of Spokane needs and deserves an office fully staffed with professionals trained to train others to work with and take reports from the survivors of hate crimes and discrimination and to improve the engagement of affected communities in policymaking and implementation processes. And UNA Spokane would like to also emphasize that this is, um, that creating such an office, the work they would do would contribute to the sustainable development goals developed at the UN, which are not just for other countries and they're not just something global. They have to be achieved locally, especially SDG 16, which reads promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. UNA Spokane is hopeful for what an Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion can do to improve the protection and promotion of civil and human rights in our local community, and ask that you provide full funding and staffing for this office so that Spokane can reach its full potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. And if you could hit star three to lower your hand, and I'd like to invite Rabbi Tamar Molino to hit star three to raise your hand. All right. Welcome, Rabbi. You have up to three minutes. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Rabbi Tamar Molino. I'm the rabbi of Temple Beshalom and Congregation Emmanuel here in Spokane. And I am here to ask that the city create a fully staffed and adequately funded Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion as envisioned in the community proposal that you heard earlier. As many of you know, our temple building and the Holocaust Memorial outside it were defaced with swastikas in February of this year, and it was a traumatic and frightening moment for our community. The red, angry swastikas sent a message that at least one person, the perpetrator in this city, wanted all Jewish people to be dead, or at the very least, for us to feel like we don't belong here. And we know he isn't alone in those sentiments, one of our city officials, which has sent an anti-Semitic hate mail just today. In response to the vandalism, though, we received an outpouring of love that outweighed the hate. There were hundreds of messages and statements of support for our community from individuals, organizations, and public figures in our city and beyond, including, including Mayor Woodward and some council members at the time as well. We had flowers dropped off at the door of our building. Neighbors stopped by and offered help to clean up, and many people made donations towards our Holocaust Education Fund and towards restoration of the memorial sculpture. Law enforcement responded quickly and efficiently, and local media gave us empathetic coverage. In short, many citizens of this city wanted to send a message that, in fact, Jews do belong here, and that they wanted us to know that they value inclusion and diversity. We were really moved to tears in many cases and incredibly grateful for all the expressions of support. But there was a question that was asked over and over again. What can we do and how can we make a difference? In our private lives, we can educate ourselves and others, talk to our friends and neighbors, and hope to establish relationships and connections in order to lessen prejudice and bigotry, racism, and anti-Semitism in our society. But in front of you now is an opportunity to do something very concrete to make a difference, to put your money where your mouth is, as they say. We as a community know you have many priorities, and this isn't the only one, but it will strengthen our tr city tremendously to have effective tools, not just to respond to these shocking expressions of hate when they occur, but to address the root causes of these acts through education and to do the even harder work, the work of addressing the fundamental inequalities that have been normalized in our society and to ensure that we respect the civil and human rights of every citizen of Spokane. We want everyone to feel like they belong here. 
Tonight is actually the second night of Hanukkah, a holiday that celebrates an ancient victory over forces of oppression, an enduring moment of religious freedom, and a miracle of light shining in a time of darkness. I hope we can all come together now to shine light into the darkness. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I'd like to invite Nagmana Sharasi to hit star three. Welcome, Nagmana. You have up to three minutes. Thank you so much, President, uh, Council President Beggs. Um, first of all, may I just say it was so pleasant to hear Stacy and Tamar. Happy Hanukkah to both of you, if you're still on here, and anyone else who celebrates, by the way. Um, I am, uh, my name is Nagmana Shirazi. I'm a resident of uh, Spokane since the last 10 years being an immigrant. And I have chosen to make District 1 my home. And one of the things that I have worked on very, very hard within the community is to um, work for the last two and a half years on this Office of Civil Rights with everybody else who has been working on this issue. Um, I do want to commend Puyan Lam and Curtis Robinson for a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much for the clarity and for all the hard work depicted by G GSP and NAACP and MCAS and uh, APEX Spokane and so many other organizations that were part and parcel in bringing this to fruition. As you saw, the model itself depicts four different areas that we are trying to address. I know that there was a, of, an Office of Civil Liberties and Rights existing at around 2005 or whatever that was. But it's, it's been an on-again, off-again off situation. And what we are wanting to see is an Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion in perpetuity from not just to be approved in the 2022 budget, but to continue and to continue regardless of whatever budget you're approving as an entity that exists and has the right and is doing the work that is needed. You've listened to everybody talking about why it's needed and how it's needed and how much it's needed, and it's time to come through on all of these um, promises that we've been hearing for a while, um, promises of making Spokane a more welcoming and inclusive city, for instance. This is just but step one. You know, I, am, I really would like to congratulate the city on hiring Gerald Haynes because as, as the first human rights coordinator. And yes, I really, really do believe Gerald has the means and, and the support and the connections in the community to bring this to fruition. But at the same time, he can't do it alone. We must, to make this event, make this whole uh, 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 venture a success, we need to make sure that we have another three, at least another three positions that we approve of in the budget coming up. We do need this Office of Civil Rights. Spokane is a growing city. We are going to get Afghan refugees who are Muslim, and they are veterans of our war, in our United States war in Afghanistan. These are educated people coming, fleeing for their lives, who speak English and who have helped the U.S. troops and the military, and so now is the time that we need to do this and come through with, with the promises and to deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Nagmana. And if you could hit star three and lower your hand, I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Rick Matters to hit star three. All right, welcome, Pastor. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of civil rights, equity, and inclusion. My name is the Reverend Rick Matters, and I reside in Spokane, where I've lived off and on uh, since birth, my being born in 1950. Uh, thank you very much for supporting the Office of Civil Rights, Equity, and Inclusion in the city's 2022 operating budget. I and many others with whom I serve are very pleased that uh, Mr. Jarrell Haynes has been hired as the human rights coordinator and officer. Fully funding and staffing the office um, as envisioned in the community proposal will help Mr. Haynes fulfill his mandate as officer and coordinator, which will in turn help the city fulfill its civic and moral obligations. 
Being both a white man and an ordained Christian minister affords me many privileges that others, including people of color, uh, different religions, immigrant uh, lifestyles, regularly do not enjoy. Part of my calling as a pastor is to work for racial equity in um, our local area and beyond. Thank you to all of the community members who worked on the proposal presented by Dr. Lamb and Mr. Robertson. Serving on the superintendent's, uh, superintendent of Spokane uh, Public School Committee on Racial Equity, on the executive committee of the NAACP, on the leadership team of SCAR, Spokane Community Against Racism, along with several other justice organizations, including my church's beloved community uh, working group. I hear many, uh, I hear story after story of oppression of indigenous, black, and other marginalized groups um, being uh, dehumanized. Uh, what what uh, remains invisible to many uh, whites is a relentless reality to many uh, marginalized people. So thank you for supporting and fully funding this office, as I hope and pray you will, and also for the hard work and hard and thorough work of, uh, that got us to this point. It re represents uh, uh, a, a significant step to heal the blight in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, and if you could hit star three and lower your hand, I'd like to invite Nicolette Ockeltree to hit star three. Welcome back, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Oh, thank you. I have a number of concerns with respect to this proposed budget, um, unidentified funding sources, assumptions about the use of ARP funds, uh, transparency frustrations, including but not limited to the lack of clarity about how the $21 million in lost revenue was actually calculated. Um, I... According to the budget, the local and state affordable housing sales tax revenue is projected to bring in over $7 million, uh, but according to the budget, all of that is being used for homeless services. Zero is being used on affordable housing. We're in, affordable, we're in a housing crisis. We need affordable housing. That's why so many people voted for that tax to be used in that way, and it needs to be used in that way. Um, and uh, let's see what else there. Oh, on page 64, it says that zero dollars in 2020 was spent on domestic violence prevention, that $500 was allotted for 2021, and $500 uh, for 2022. Um, I wonder how much we've given the police department for equipment and wages to combat domestic violence crimes. I don't know what that number is, but it's a lot of money. And considering how bad domestic violence is here in Spokane, I think we should probably start spending more than zero to $500 on domestic violence prevention. So perhaps that could be beefed up a little bit. Um, civil rights doesn't show up anywhere in the budget whatsoever. I do see diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it's described as an office within HR for employees. So I don't think that's the same thing that people have been championing this evening. Um, I think budgeting in new jobs like a deputy administrator in the mayor's office before filling the crucial positions elsewhere makes no sense. Um, the $2.6 million for operating Canon for one year uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Somebody earlier mentioned that they thought 60 beds were at Canon. So uh, let's just assume it's 60 beds. $2.6 million for 60 beds for a year works out to uh, 43, over $43,000 uh, per bed per year. It's over $118 a day per bed. I mean, $43,000 a year, that's almost as much as a city council salary. And it's way more than the uh, average salary for somebody making $15 an hour or working full time. Um, it just it doesn't make sense. To me, and I actually think that Canon has 72 beds, so it would be a little bit um, uh, less than that. But it still doesn't make sense to try to solve the problem in this way with that cost. And uh, so I really think that needs to be looked into. Um, I don't. I don't think I have much time to go into more of these budgetary concerns, but I do hope that uh, you. Uh, consider these comments, and I really echo all the things that everybody else has been saying about the Office of Civil Rights. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you, Nicolette. If you could hit star three and lower your hand, and I'd like to invite Anwar Peace to hit star three to raise your hand. Welcome to City Council. Anwar, you have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. I'm here tonight to support the community proposal on creating a new city of civil rights, equity, and inclusion within our city government which should be fully funded and fully staffed. Now is the time for the city of Spokane to show the community that this town stands for the values of equality and inclusion by creating this office of civil rights. This new office would make our city a more just, equitable, and inclusive Eastern Washington community. And it's shocking that the second big, biggest city in the state doesn't have an office of civil rights already. And this fact is very telling on who we are as a community. Spokane in our region is known as the Pacific's Northwest little owned version of the American Deep South. And Spokane has gained this reputation due to the fact that this town's long history in the facts of tolerating racial incidents in this community. Some of those incidents involving, involved bombing attempts. Just last year, a new Nazi group used a six month flyer campaign as a way of intimidating Spokane neighbors which this campaign, cul this campaign culminated in one group member perpetrating a hate crime against the local synagogue. If Spokane at the time had an office of civil rights, that office could have immediately started an investigation once those first Nazi flyers were put on car windshields. The office of civil rights could have worked with those neighborhoods that were affected by those Nazi flyers and heard those neighbors' safety and security concerns. As well, the city office could have created a citywide educational ad campaign of inclusion highlighting the diversity in our community. After, after the synagogue attack, instead of only having individual city leaders denounce those incidents, the Office of Civil Rights could have issued a press release or had press conferences in order for there to be a clear message from the city of Spokane that hate truly will not be tolerated in this town. Now in this new community proposal that's that has been brought forth, creating this new Office of Civil Rights. The citizens are urging the city government to finally show the community that our city leaders truly do understand the importance of equity and inclusion by creating the Office of the City of Spokane Office of Civil Rights, Inclusion, and Equity, which this office should be fully staffed with at least six staff members, and that, that this is of this office be fully funded with the resources that it needs. And finally, the Office of Civil Rights should be truly independent from any kind of political interference to do their hard work. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anwar. That brings us to the end of public commentary for the budget hearing. Is there a motion to continue the 2022 budget hearing until December 6th? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any commentary? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right, the budget hearing is continued until next Monday. That brings us to the end of our legislative session, except for open forum. We have two people signed up to speak, uh, and that's Rick Matters and Nicolette Ockeltree. Um, Pastor Matters, if you'd like to hit star three to raise your hand. All right, welcome back, Pastor Matters. You have up to three minutes. Uh, thank you. I'm um, just speak briefly because I uh, understand you're considering whether to fund the resource center, uh, continue funding it. And so I just wanted to uh, first thank you for the opportunity to speak on this subject and uh, also thank you and the city for the vision that established the resource center. I think it's a uh, uh, a, a worthy vision. I'm just going to and um, Pastor, I was just yeah, going to interrupt. Go you, ahead. We did. We funded it earlier today at our consent agenda, so we did. Oh, we did. Well, so. hallelujah, and I'll relinquish my time then. <laughs> okay. right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and Nicolette Ockeltree, if you want to hit star three. All right, welcome back, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. So, 
Thank you. What a perfect segue to what I wanted to cover today. Um, sometimes I feel as though some controversial items are put on the consent agenda rather than the legislative agenda to avoid having to hear public testimony on those items. There doesn't seem to be any consistent method employed uh, to determine if something will end up on one or the other. I am of the opinion that public testimony should be allowed on consent agenda items. Every week, millions of dollars of claims and payments are approved that technically no citizen can comment on until after they've been approved because you can't give testimony on consent agenda items and you can't give testimony during open forum on anything that appears on the agenda that day or on a posted advanced agenda. Uh, please consider allowing public testimony on consent agenda items or at the very least, please be transparent about the decision-making process or policy involved in determining whether or not an item gets listed on the consent agenda versus the legislative agenda. And with my last remaining moments, I know there's only two city council meetings after this uh, left in this year. And in case I don't see it during a, the next open forums to say so, I just wanted to say how grateful I am um, for uh, Councilwoman Mum and Councilwoman Burke's work um, as, as uh, city council members. They've been fantastic people, and I really appreciate everything that they've done, and they're just truly inspirational women, and they've worked so hard, and I just, I really champion everything that they've done, and, you know, I'll be sad to see you go, but I really look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nicolette, and I did want to thank uh, all the council members, and we have a lot of staff people who are helping us here, both the city clerk's office and the director of city council, and we've got our TV people, and we've got planning people, and we have a lot of uh, city council staff people who are watching and helping us stay on top of it. This was a long meeting, and I really appreciate everyone's engagement in it, so thanks for that. Next week will not be as long, I promise, and um, just want to Thank everyone for all that you do for the city and for everyone who participated in the meeting. Uh, if you take care of yourself and if you can take care of someone else, we're adjourned for tonight.